Judge Kavanaugh, we welcome you. Are you ready? I have a, I have a, something I want to clear up from the last meeting that doesn't uh, affect you. So before I swear you, uh, I would uh, like to uh, explain my response to Senator Kennedy right after the break. At that time, I entered into the record the statements of three witnesses Dr. Ford said were also at the party. These statements were provided to us under penalty of felony by lying to, if you lie to Congress. As soon as uh, my team uh, learned the names of these three potential witnesses, we immediately uh, reached out to them uh, requesting an interview. In response, all three submitted statements to us denying any knowledge of the uh, gathering Dr. Ford uh, described. Uh, if we had calls with them, we would have uh, invited the minority to join. Every time that we've received any information regarding Judge Kavanaugh, we've uh, sought to immediately follow through and investigate. The minority staff sat on Dr. Ford's letter for weeks and staff told us that they believed it is, quote, highly inappropriate to have these follow-up calls before the FBI finishes its investigation, end of quote, even though the FBI had completed its uh, background uh, information. Uh, when we followed up with Judge Kavanaugh after we received Dr. Ford's allegations, the ranking member staff didn't join us, even though these calls are usually done on a bipartisan basis. They joined other calls with the judge, but they didn't participate or ask any questions. Would you please rise, sir? Yes. Uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. Yeah. And like we, uh, like we offered to uh, Senator or to Dr. Ford, uh, you can take whatever time you want now for your opening statement. Then we'll go to questions. So proceed. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to make my statement. I wrote it myself yesterday afternoon and evening. No one has seen a draft, or it, except for one of my former law clerks. This is my statement. Less than two weeks ago, Dr. Ford publicly accused me of committing wrongdoing at an event more than 36 years ago, when we were both in high school. I denied the allegation immediately, categorically, and unequivocally. All four people allegedly at the event, including Dr. Ford's longtime friend, Ms. Kaiser, have said they recall no such event. Her longtime friend, Ms. Kaiser, said under penalty of felony that she does not know me and does not believe she ever saw me at a party ever. Here is the quote from Ms. Kaiser's attorney's letter. Quote, simply put, Ms. Kaiser does not know Mr. Kavanaugh, and she has no recollection of ever being at a party or gathering where he was present, with or without Dr. Ford. End quote. Think about that fact. The day after the allegation appeared, I told this committee that I wanted a hearing as soon as possible to clear my name. I demanded a hearing for the very next day. Unfortunately, it took the committee 10 days to get to this hearing. In those 10 long days, as was predictable, and as I predicted, my family and my name have been totally and permanently destroyed <coughs> by vicious and false additional accusations. The 10-day delay has been harmful to me and my family, to the Supreme Court, and to the country. When this allegation first arose, I welcomed any kind of investigation, Senate, FBI or otherwise. The committee now has conducted a thorough investigation and I've cooperated fully. I know 
that any kind of investigation, Senate, FBI, Montgomery County Police, whatever, will clear me. Listen to the people I know. Listen to the people who have known me my whole life. Listen to the people I've grown up with and worked with and played with and coached with and dated and taught and gone to games with and had beers with. And listen to the witnesses who allegedly were at this event 36 years ago. Listen to Ms. Kaiser. She does not know me. I was not at the party described by Dr. Ford. This confirmation process has become a national disgrace. The Constitution gives the Senate an important role in the confirmation process. But you have replaced advice and consent with search and destroy. Since my nomination in July, there has been a frenzy on the left to come up with something, anything, to block my confirmation. Shortly after I was nominated, the Democratic Senate leader said he would, quote, oppose me with everything he's got. A Democratic senator on this committee publicly, publicly referred to me as evil. Evil. Think about that word. And said that those who supported me were, quote, complicit in evil. Another Democratic senator on this committee said, quote, Judge Kavanaugh is your worst nightmare. A former head of the Democratic National Committee said, quote, Judge Kavanaugh will threaten the lives of millions of Americans for decades to come. I understand the passions of the moment, but I would say to those senators, your words have meaning. Millions of Americans listened carefully to you. Given comments like those, is it any surprise that people have been willing to do anything to make any physical threat against my family, to send any violent email to my wife, to make any kind of allegation against me and against my friends, to blow me up and take me down? You sowed the wind. For decades to come, I fear that the whole country will reap the whirlwind. The behavior of several of the Democratic members of this committee at my hearing a few weeks ago was an embarrassment. But at least it was just a good old-fashioned attempt at borking. Those efforts didn't work. When I did at least okay enough at the hearings that it looked like I might actually get confirmed, a new tactic was needed. Some of you were lying in wait and had it ready. This first allegation was held in secret for weeks by a Democratic member of this committee and by staff. It would be needed only if you couldn't take me out on the merits. When it was needed, this allegation was unleashed and publicly deployed over Dr. Ford's wishes. And then, and then, as no doubt was expected, if not planned, came a long series of false last minute smears designed to scare me and drive me out of the process before any hearing occurred. Crazy stuff, gangs, illegitimate children, fights on boats in Rhode Island, all nonsense, reported breathlessly and often uncritically by the media. This has destroyed my family and my good name, a good name built up through decades of very hard work and public service at the highest levels of the American government. This whole two-week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit fueled with apparent pent-up anger about President Trump and the 2016 election, fear that has been unfairly stoked about my judicial record, revenge on behalf of the Clintons, and millions of dollars in money from outside left-wing opposition groups. This is a circus. 
The consequences will extend long past my nomination. The consequences will be with us for decades. This grotesque and coordinated character assassination will dissuade competent and good people of all political persuasions from serving our country. And as we all know, in the United States political system of the early 2000s, what goes around comes around. I am an optimistic guy. I always try to be on the sunrise side of the mountain, to be optimistic about the day that is coming. But today, I have to say that I fear for the future. Last time I was here, I told this committee that a federal judge must be independent, not swayed by public or political pressure. I said I was such a judge, and I am. I will not be intimidated into withdrawing from this process. You've tried hard. You've given it your all. No one can question your effort. But your coordinated and well-funded effort to destroy my good name and destroy my family will not drive me out. The vile threats of violence against my family will not drive me out. You may defeat me in the final vote, but you'll never get me to quit. Never. I'm here today to tell the truth. I've never sexually assaulted anyone, not in high school, not in college, not ever. Sexual assault is horrific. One of my closest friends to this day is a woman who was sexually abused and who in the 1990s, when we were in our 30s, confided in me about the abuse and sought my advice. I was one of the only people she consulted. Allegations of sexual assault must always be taken seriously, always. Those who make allegations always deserve to be heard. At the same time, the person who is the subject of the allegations also deserves to be heard. Due process is a foundation of the American rule of law. Due process means listening to both sides. As I told you at my hearing three weeks ago, I'm the only child of Martha and Ed Cavanaugh. They are here today. When I was 10, my mom went to law school, and as a lawyer, she worked hard and overcame barriers, including the workplace sexual harassment that so many women faced at the time and still face today. She became a trailblazer, one of Maryland's earliest women prosecutors and trial judges. She and my dad taught me the importance of equality and respect for all people, and she inspired me to be a lawyer and a judge. Last time I was here, I told you that when my mom was a prosecutor and I was in high school, she used to practice her closing arguments at the dining room table on my dad and me. As I told you, her trademark line was, use your common sense. What rings true? What rings false? Her trademark line is a good reminder as we sit here today some 36 years after the alleged event occurred, when there is no corroboration, and indeed it is refuted by the people allegedly there. After I have been in the public arena for 26 years without even a hint, a whiff of an allegation like this, and when my nomination to the Supreme Court was just about to be voted on at a time when I'm called evil by a Democratic member of this committee, while Democratic opponents of my nomination say people will die if I am confirmed. This onslaught of last-minute allegations does not ring true. I'm not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person in some place at some time. But I have never done this to her or to anyone. That's not who I am. It is not who I was. I am innocent of this charge. 
I intend no ill will to Dr. Ford and her family. The other night, Ashley and my daughter Liza said their prayers. And little Liza, all 10 years old, said to Ashley, we should pray for the woman. It's a lot of wisdom from a 10 year old. We mean, we mean no ill will. First, let's start with my career. For the last 26 years, since 1992, I've served in many high profile and sensitive government positions for which the FBI has investigated my background six separate times. Six separate FBI background investigations over 26 years, all of them after the event alleged here. I have been in the public arena and under extreme public scrutiny for decades. In 1992, I worked for the Office of Solicitor General in the Department of Justice. In 1993, I clerked on the Supreme Court for Justice Anthony Kennedy. I spent four years in the Independent Counsel's Office during the 1990s. That office was the subject of enormous scrutiny from the media and the public. During 1998, the year of the impeachment of President Clinton, our office generally, and I personally, were in the middle of an intense national media and political spotlight. I and other leading members of Ken Starr's office were opposition researched from head to toe, from birth through the present day. Recall the people who were exposed that year of 1998 as having engaged in some sexual wrongdoing or indiscretions in their past. One person on the left even paid a million dollars for people to report evidence of sexual wrongdoing, and it worked. He exposed some prominent people. Nothing about me. From 2001 to 2006, I worked for President George W. Bush in the White House. As staff secretary, I was by President Bush's side for three years and was entrusted with the nation's most sensitive secrets. I traveled on Air Force One all over the country and the world with President Bush. I went everywhere with him, from Texas to Pakistan, from Alaska to Australia, from Buckingham Palace to the Vatican. Three years in the West Wing, five and a half years in the White House. I was then nominated to be a judge on the D.C. Circuit. I was thoroughly vetted by the White House, the FBI, the American Bar Association, and this committee. I sat before this committee for two thorough confirmation hearings in 2004 and 2006. For the past 12 years leading up to my nomination for this job, I've served in a very public arena as a federal judge on what is often referred to as the second most important court in the country. I've handled some of the most significant and sensitive cases affecting the lives and liberties of the American people. I have been a good judge. And for this nomination, another FBI background investigation, another American Bar Association investigation, 31 hours of hearings, 65 senator meetings, 1,200 written questions, more than all previous Supreme Court nominees combined. Throughout that entire time, throughout my 53 years and seven months on this earth until last week, no one ever accused me of any kind of sexual misconduct. No one ever. A lifetime, a lifetime of public service and a lifetime of high profile public service at the highest levels of American government, and never a hint of anything of this kind. And that's because nothing of this kind ever happened. Second, let's turn to specifics. I categorically and unequivocally de deny the allegation against me by Dr. Ford. 
I never had any sexual or physical encounter of any kind with Dr. Ford. I never attended a gathering like the one Dr. Ford describes in her allegation. I've never sexually assaulted Dr. Ford or anyone. Again, I am not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person in some place at some time, but I've never done that to her or to anyone. Dr. Ford's allegation stems from a party that she alleges occurred during the summer of 1982, 36 years ago. I was 17 years old between my junior and senior years of high school at Georgetown Prep, a rigorous all boys Catholic Jesuit high school in Rockville, Maryland. When my friends and I spent time together at parties on weekends, it was usually with friends from nearby Catholic all-girls high schools, Stone Ridge, Holy Child, Visitation, Immaculata, Holy Cross. Dr. Ford did not attend one of those schools. She attended an independent private school named Holton Arms, and she was a year behind me. She and I did not travel in the same social circles. It is possible that we met at some point, at some events, although I do not recall that. To repeat, all of the people identified by Dr. Ford as being present at the party have said they do not remember any such party ever happening. Importantly, her friend, Ms. Kaiser, has not only denied knowledge of the party, Ms. Kaiser said under penalty of felony, she does not know me does not recall ever being at a party with me ever. And my two male friends who were allegedly there, who knew me well, have told this committee under penalty of felony that they do not recall any such party and that I never did or would do anything like this. Dr. Ford's allegation is not merely uncorroborated. It is refuted by the very people she says were there including by a longtime friend of hers, refuted. Third, Dr. Ford has said that this event occurred at a house near Columbia Country Club, which is at the corner of Connecticut Avenue and East West Highway in Chevy Chase, Maryland. In her letter to Senator Feinstein, she said that there were four other people at the house. But none of those people, nor I, lived near Columbia Country Club. As of the summer of 1982, Dr. Ford was 15 and could not drive yet. And she did not live near Columbia Country Club. She says confidently that she had one beer at the party. But she does not say how she got to the house in question, or how she got home, or whose house it was. Fourth. I've submitted to this committee detailed calendars recording my activities in the summer of 1982. Why did I keep calendars? My dad started keeping de detailed calendars of his life in 1978. He did so as both a calendar and a diary. He's a very organized guy, to put it mildly. Yeah. Christmas time, we sit around and he regales us with old stories, old milestones old weddings, old events from his calendars. In ninth grade, in ninth grade in 1980, I started keeping calendars of my own. For me also, it's both a calendar and a diary. I've kept such calendars diaries for the last 38 years. Mine are not as good as my dad's, 
in some years. And when I was a kid, the calendars are about what you would expect from a kid. Some goofy parts, some embarrassing parts. But I did have the summer of 1982 documented pretty well. The event described by Dr. Ford presumably happened on a weekend because I believe everyone worked and had jobs in the summers. And in any event, a drunken early evening event of the kind she describes presumably happened on a weekend. If it was a weekend, my calendars show that I was out of town almost every weekend night before football training camp started in late August. The only weekend nights that I was in D.C. were Friday, June 4, when I was with my dad at a pro golf tournament. And had my high school achievement test at 8.30 the next morning. I also was in D.C. on Saturday night, August 7th. But I was at a small gathering at Becky's house in Rockville with Matt, Denise, Lori, and Jenny. Their names are all listed on my calendar. I won't use their last names here. And then on the weekend of August 20 to 22nd, I was staying at the Garrett's with Pat and Chris as we did final preparations for football training camp that began on Sunday the 22nd. As the calendars confirm, the wet, that weekend before a brutal football training camp schedule was no time for parties. So let me emphasize this point. If the party described by Dr. Ford happened in the summer of 1982 on a weekend night, my calendar shows all but definitively that I was not there. During the weekdays in the summer of 1982, as you can see, I was out of town for two weeks of the summer for a trip to the beach with friends and at the legendary five-star basketball camp in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. When I was in town, I spent much of my time working, working out, lifting weights, playing basketball, or hanging out and having some beers with friends as we talked about life and football and school and girls. Some have noticed that I didn't have church on Sundays on my calendars. I also didn't list brushing my teeth. And for me, going to church on Sundays was like brushing my teeth. Automatic, still is. In the summer of 1981, I had worked construction in the summer of 1982, my job was cutting lawns. I had my own business of sorts. You see some specifics about the lawn cutting listed on the August calendar page. When I had to time the last lawn cuttings of the summer of various lawns before football training camp. I played in a lot of summer league basketball games for the Georgetown prep team at night at Blair High School in Silver Spring. Many nights I worked out with other guys at Tobin's house. He was the great quarterback on our football team. And his dad ran workouts. Or lifted weights at Georgetown Prep in preparation for the football season. I attended and watched many sporting events, as is my habit to this day. The calendars show a few weekday gatherings at friends' houses after a workout or just to meet up and have some beers. But none of those gatherings included the group of people that Dr. Ford has identified. And as my calendars show, I was very precise about listing who was there. Very precise. And keeping, keep in mind, my calendars also were diaries of sorts, forward-looking and backward-looking, just like my dad's. You can see, for example, that I crossed out missed workouts and the canceled doctor's appointments, and that I listed the precise people who had shown up for 
certain events. The calendars are obviously not dispositive on their own, but they are another piece of evidence in the mix for you to consider. Fifth, Dr. Ford's allegation is radically inconsistent with my record and my character from my youth to the present day. As students at an all-boys Catholic Jesuit school, many of us became friends and remain friends to this day with students at local Catholic all-girls schools. One feature of my life that has remained true to the present day is that I've always had a lot of close female friends. I'm not talking about girlfriends. I'm talking about friends who are women. That started in high school. Maybe it was because I'm an only child and had no sisters. But anyway, we had no social media or text or email and we talked on the phone. I remember talking almost every night, it seemed, to my friends Amy or Julie. Or Kristen, or Karen, or Suzanne, or Maura, or Megan, or Nikki. The list goes on. Friends for a lifetime, built on a foundation of talking through school and life starting at age 14. Several of those great women are in the seats right behind me today. My friends and I sometimes got together and had parties on weekends. The drinking age was 18 in Maryland for most of my time in high school and was 18 in D.C. for all of my time in high school. I drank beer with my friends. Almost everyone did. Sometimes I had too many beers. Sometimes others did. I liked beer. I still like beer, but I did not drink beer to the point of blacking out, and I never sexually assaulted anyone. There is a bright line between drinking beer, which I gladly do, and which I fully embrace, and sexually assaulting someone, which is a violent crime. If every American who drinks beer, or every American who drank beer in high school is suddenly presumed guilty of sexual assault will be an ugly new place in this country. I never committed sexual assault. As high school students, we sometimes did goofy or stupid things. I doubt we are alone in looking back at high school and cringing at some things. For one thing, our yearbook was a disaster. I think some editors and students wanted the yearbook to be some combination of Animal House, Caddyshack, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which were all recent movies at that time. Many of us went along in the yearbook to the point of absurdity. This past week, my friends and I have cringed. when we read about it and talked to each other. One thing in particular we're sad about one of our good One of our good female friends who we would admire and went to dances with had her name used on the yearbook page with the term alumnus. That yearbook re reference was clumsily intended to show affection and that she was one of us. But in this circus, the media has interpreted the term as related to sex. It was not related to sex. As the woman herself noted to the media on the record, she and I never had any sexual interaction of, at all. 
I'm so sorry to her for that yearbook reference. This may sound a bit trivial, given all that we are here for, but one thing I want to try to make sure, sure of in the future is my friendship with her. She was and is a great person. As to sex, this is not a topic I ever imagined would come up at a judicial confirmation hearing, but I want to give you a full picture of who I was. I never had sexual intercourse or anything close to it during high school or for many years after that. In some crowds, I was probably a little outwardly shy about my inexperience. I tried to hide that. At the same time, I was also inwardly proud of it. For me and the girls who I was friends with, that lack of major or rampant sexual activity in high school was a matter of faith and respect and caution. The committee has a letter from 65 women who knew me in high school. They said that I always treated them with dignity and respect. That letter came together in one night. 35 years after graduation, while a sexual assault allegation was pending against me in a very fraught and public situation where they knew, they knew they'd be vilified if they defended me. Think about that. They put themselves on the line for me. Those are some awesome women, and I love all of them. <laughs> you also have a letter from women who knew me in college. Most were varsity athletes, and they described that I treated them as friends and equals and supported them in their sports at a time when women's sports was emerging in the wake of Title IX. I thank all of them for all of their texts and their emails and their support. <clears throat> One of those women friends from college, a self-described liberal and feminist, sent me a text last night that said, quote, deep breaths, you're a good man, a good man, a good man. A text yesterday from another of those women friends from college said, quote, Brett, be strong, pulling for you to my core. <coughs> A third text yesterday from yet another of those women I'm friends with from college said, I'm holding you in the light of God. As I said in my opening statement the last time I was with you, cherish your friends, look out for your friends, lift up your friends, love your friends. I felt that love more over the last two weeks than I ever have in my life. I thank all my friends. I love all my friends. Throughout my life, I've devoted huge efforts to encouraging and promoting the careers of women. I will put my record up against anyone's, male or female. I am proud of the letter from 84 women, 84 women who worked with me at the Bush White House from 2001 to 2006 and described me as, quote, a man of the highest integrity. Read the op-ed from Sarah Day from Yarmouth, Maine. She worked in Oval Office operations outside of President Bush's office. Here's what she recently wrote in centralmaine.com. And today she stands by her comments. Quote, Brett was an advocate for young women like me. 
He encouraged me to take on more responsibility and to feel confident in my role. In fact, during the 2004 Republican National Convention, Brett gave me the opportunity to help with the preparation and review of the president's remarks, something I never something I never would have had the chance to do if he had not included me. And he didn't just include me in the work. He made sure I was at Madison Square Garden to watch the president's speech instead of back at the hotel watching on TV. End quote. As a judge since 2006, I've had the privilege of hiring four recent law school graduates to serve as my law clerks each year. The law clerks for federal judges are the best and brightest graduates of American law schools. They work for one-year terms for judges after law school, and then they move on in their careers. For judges, training these young lawyers is an important responsibility. The clerks will become the next generation of American lawyers and leaders, judges and senators. Just after I took the bench in 2006, there was a major New York Times story about the low numbers of women law clerks at the Supreme Court and federal appeals courts. I took notice and I took action. A majority of my 48 law clerks over the last 12 years have been women. In a letter to this committee, my women law clerk said I was one of the strongest advocates in the federal judiciary for women lawyers. And they wrote that the legal profession is fairer and more equal because of me. In my time on the bench, no federal judge, not a single one in the country, has sent more women law clerks to clerk on the Supreme Court than I have. Before this allegation arose two weeks ago, I was required to start making certain administrative preparations for my possible transfer to the Supreme Court, just in case I was confirmed. As part of that, I had to, in essence, contingently hire a first group of four law clerks who could be available to clerk at the Supreme Court for me on a moment's notice. I did so and contingently hired four law clerks. All four are women. If confirmed, I'll be the first justice in the history of the Supreme Court to have a group of all women law clerks. That is who I am. That is who I was. Over the past 12 years, I've taught constitutional law to hundreds of students, primarily at Harvard Law School, while I was hired by then Dean and now Justice Elena Kagan. One of my former women students, a Democrat, testified to this committee that I was an even-handed professor who treats people fairly and with respect. In a letter to this committee, my former students, male and female alike, wrote that I displayed a character that impressed us all. I love teaching law, but thanks to what some of you on this side of the committee have unleashed, I may never be able to teach again. For the past seven years, I've coached my two daughters' basketball teams. You saw many of those girls when they came to my hearing for a couple of hours. You have a letter from the parents of the girls I coached that described my dedication, commitment, and character. I coached because I know that a girl's confidence on the basketball court translates into confidence in other aspects of life. I love coaching more than anything I've ever done in my whole life. But thanks to what some of you on this side of the committee have unleashed, I may never be able to coach again. I've been a judge for 12 years. I have a long record of service to America and to the Constitution. 
I revere the Constitution. I am deeply grateful to President Trump for nominating me. He was so gracious to my family and me on the July night. He announced my nomination at the White House. I thank him for his steadfast support. When I accepted the president's nomination, Ashley and I knew this process would be challenging. We never expected that it would devolve into this. Explaining this to our daughters has been about the worst experience of our lives. Ashley has been a rock. I thank God every day for Ashley and my family. We live in a country devoted to due process and the rule of law. That means taking allegations seriously. But if the mere allegation, the mere assertion of an allegation, a refuted allegation from 36 years ago, is enough to destroy a person's life and career, we will have abandoned the basic principles of fairness and due process that define our legal system and our country. I ask you to judge me by the standard that you would want applied to your father, your husband, your brother, or your son. My family and I intend no ill will toward Dr. Ford or her family. But I swear today, under oath, before the Senate and the nation, before my family and God, I am innocent of this charge. Thank you, uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, before we uh, start questions, uh, I won't repeat what I said this morning, but we'll do it the same way uh, as we did for Dr. Ford uh, and uh, five minute rounds. And so we will start with uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mitchell. Good afternoon, Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, we have not met. My name is Rachel Mitchell. I'd like to go over a couple of guidelines for our uh, question and answer session today. If I ask a question. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. If I ask a Thank question, you. if I ask a question that you do not, please let me know you're estimating. Now I want to make sure that all of the committee members have gotten a copy of the definition of sexual behavior. Yes, I, at least I have one. I don't know. Okay. We all do. Yeah. And you have that as well, Judge Kavanaugh? No. Yeah. Okay. First of all, have you been given or reviewed a copy of the questions that I will be asking you? No. Has anyone told you the questions that I will be asking you? No. I want you to take a moment to review the definition that's before you of sexual behavior. You had a chance to review it? I have. I may refer back to it if I can. Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to point out two specific parts. Among the examples of sexual behavior, it includes rubbing or grinding your genitals against somebody, clothed or unclothed. And I would also point out that the definition applies whether or not the acts were sexually motivated or, for example, horseplay. Do you understand the definition I've given you? I do. And again, if at any time you need to review that, please, please let me know. Dr. Ford has stated that somewhere between five or six people 
were present at the gathering on this date. You, Mark Judge, Leland Ingham at the time, or Leland Kaiser now, Patrick P.J. Smith, Dr. Ford, and, and an unnamed boy. Do you know Mark Judge? I do. How do you know him? Uh, he was a friend at Georgetown Prep starting in ninth grade. Uh, he's uh, uh, someone we were in our, you know, group of friends. We're a very friendly group in class. You saw the letter that's been sent by my friends from Georgetown Prep. Uh, funny guy, great writer, uh, popular, developed a serious addiction problem that lasted decades, near death a couple times from his addiction. Uh, suffered tremendously from what is your relationship with him like now I haven't talked to him in a couple of years we've probably been on you know mass emails that or group emails uh, that go around among my high school friends okay. and how did you know Patrick Smith also ninth grade uh, Georgetown prep uh, went by PJ then uh, he and I lived close to one another, uh, played football together. He was defensive tackle. I was the cornerback, wide receiver. We carpooled to school along with, uh, D Davis every year, the three of us for two years. I didn't have a car. So one of the two of them would drive every day and I'd be in the, you know, they'd pick me up, uh, What's your relationship like with him now? He lives in the area. I see him once in a while. I haven't seen him since this, this thing. Do you know Leland Ingham or Leland Kaiser? I, I know of her, uh, and it, it's possible I, uh, you know, saw her, met her in high school at some point, uh, at some event. Yeah, I know her. She's a, I know of her, and and again, I don't want to rule out having crossed paths with her in high school. Similar to your uh, statements about knowing Dr. Ford? Correct. Senator Feinstein. Judge Kavanaugh, it's my understanding that you have denied the allegations by Dr. Ford, Ms. Ramirez, and Ms. Swetnick. Is that correct? Yes. All three of these women have asked the FBI to investigate their claims. Um, I listened carefully to what you said. Your concern is evident and clear. And if you're very confident of your position and you appear to be, why aren't you also asking the FBI to investigate these claims? Senator, I'll do whatever the committee wants. I wanted a hearing the day after the allegation came up. I wanted to be here that day. Instead, 10 days passed where all this nonsense is coming out, you know, that I'm in gangs, I'm on boats in Rhode Island, I'm in Colorado, you know, I'm cited all over the place. And these things are printed and run breathlessly by cable news. You know, I wanted a hearing the next day. I, my family's been destroyed by this, Senator. Destroyed. And, and, I'm, and, I'm and, and whoever wants, you know, whatever the committee decides, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all in question immediately. Is, I'm all in immediately. You know, and the terrible and hard part of this is when we get an allegation, we're not in a position to prove it or disprove it. Therefore, we have to depend on some outside authority for it. And it, would, it just seemed to me then when these allegations came forward that you would want the FBI to investigate those claims and clear it up once and for all. Senator, uh, the committee investigates. It's not for me to, to say how to do it, but just so you know, the FBI doesn't reach a conclusion. They would give you a, a couple 302s that just tell you what we said. So I'm here. I wanted to be here. I wanted to be here the next day. 
It was an, it's an outrage that I was not allowed to come and immediately defend my name and say, I didn't do this and give you all this evidence. I'm not even, I'm not even in D.C. on the weekends in the summer of 1982. <laughs> this happened on a weekday? Well, is it, would, 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 I'm not at a Blair High School for a summer league game. I'm not at Tobin's house working out. I'm not at a movie with Suzanne. <laughs> You know, I wanted to be here right away. That well, the difficult thing is that it, the, these these hearings are set and um, set by the majority. Um, but I'm talking about getting the evidence and having the evidence looked at. And I don't understand. You know, we hear from the witnesses. Um, but the FBI isn't interviewing them and isn't giving us any facts. So all we have... You're interviewing me. Say, you're interviewing me. You're, you're doing it, Senator. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're well, doing it. That's the, the, there's no conclusions reached. And, and what you're saying, if, if I understand it, is that the allegations by Dr. Ford, Ms. Ramirez, and Ms. Fetnick, Swetnick um, are, are wrong. Yeah, that that is emphatically what I'm saying. Emphatically, the Swetnick thing is a joke. That is a farce. Would you like to say more about it? No. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Miss Mitchell. Okay. Dr. Ford has described you as being intoxicated at a party. Did you consume alcohol during your high school years? Yes, we drank beer. Uh, my friends and I, the boys and girls, yes, we drank beer. I liked beer, still like beer. We drank beer. The drinking age, as I noted, was 18, so the seniors were legal. Senior year in high school, people were legal to drink. And we drink, yeah, we drank beer. And I said sometimes, sometimes probably had too many beers, and sometimes other people had too many beers. <laughs> What we drank beer. We liked beer. What do you consider to be too many beers? I don't know. Uh, you know, we, whatever the chart says uh, on your blood alcohol chart. When you talked to Fox News the other night, you said that there were times in high school when people might have had too many beers on occasion. Does that include you? Sure. Okay. Have you ever passed out from drinking? I've, uh, passed out would be no, but I've gone to sleep, but, but I've never blacked out. That's the, that's the, the, the allegation, uh, and uh, that, that, that's wrong. So let's talk about your time in high school. In high school, after drinking, did you ever wake up in a different location than you remembered passing out or going to sleep? No, no. Did you ever wake up with your clothes in a different condition or fewer clothes on than you remembered when you went to sleep or passed out? No, yeah, no. Did you ever tell, uh, uh, did anyone ever tell you about something that happened in your presence that you didn't remember in, uh, during a time that you had been drinking? No, the, the, we drank beer and you know, so so did I think the vast majority of of people our age at the time. But in any event, we drank beer and and uh, still do. So whatever, yeah. During the time in high school when you would be drinking, did anyone ever tell you about something that you did not remember? No. Dr. Ford described a small gathering of people at a suburban Maryland home in the summer of 1982. She said that Mark Judge, P.J. Smith, and Leland Ingham also were present, as well as an unknown uh, male, and that the people were drinking to varying degrees. Were you ever at a gathering that fits that description? No, as I've said in my opening statements, opening statement. Dr. Ford described an incident where she was alone in a room with you and Mark Judge. 
Have you ever been alone in a room with Dr. Ford and Mark Judge? No. Dr. Ford described an incident where you were grinding your genitals on her. Have you ever ground or rubbed your genitals against Dr. Ford? No. Dr. Ford described an incident where you covered her mouth with your hand. Have you ever covered Dr. Ford's mouth with your hand? No. Dr. Ford described an incident where you tried to remove her clothes. Have you ever tried to remove her clothes? No. Referring back to the definition of sexual behavior that I have given you, have you ever at any time engaged in sexual behavior with Dr. Ford? No. Have you ever engaged in sexual behavior with Dr. Ford, even if it was consensual? No. I want to talk about your calendars. Uh, you submitted to the committee copies of the handwritten calendars that you've talked about for the months of May, June, July, and August of 1982. Do you have them in front of you? I do. Did you create these calendars in the sense of all the handwriting that's on them? Yes. Okay. Is it exclusively your handwriting? Yes. When did you make these entries? In, in 1982. Has anything changed, been changed for those since 1982? No. Do these calendars represent your plans for each day or do they document, in other words, prospectively, or do they document what actually occurred more like a diary? They're both forward-looking and backward-looking, as you can tell by looking at them, because I cross out certain doctor's appointments that didn't happen, or uh, one night where I was supposed to lift weights, I crossed that out, because I obviously didn't make it that night. So you can see things that I didn't do uh, crossed out in retrospect. And also, when I list the specific people who I was with, that is um, likely backward-looking. You explain that you kept these calendars because your father started keeping them in 1978, I believe you said. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you kept them. In other words, you wrote on them, but why did you keep them up until oh. this time? Well, he's kept them too since 1978, so uh, he's a good role model. Miss Mitchell, you'll have to stop. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh has asked for a break, so we'll take a 15 minute break. Unfortunately, the FBI has never interviewed him. Um, we would not be able to have his attendance here. The chairman um, refuses to call him. If she's saying Mark Judge was in the room then, then he should be in the room here today. Uh, would you want him called as a witness? Senator. This allegation came into the committee. Oh, no, no, I, I'm mean, just asking the question. Would you want him to be here as a witness? He's, he's already provided sworn testimony to the committee. This allegation's been hidden well, by the committee, uh, now, by, by well, members of it the hasn't committee. Been, it has not been investigated by the FBI. The committee has refused to allow it to be. It was dropped on me. It was sprung. It was not investigated by the FBI, and he has not been called where he might be under Should have been handled in the due course, Senator. No, then, when he came I, in, I would uh, I would disagree with that. I've been on this committee 44 years, both Republicans and Democrats. I've never seen somebody that critical and not allowed to be here to uh, call to be testified or an FBI background. But let he's, me he's provided sworn testimony, and the and, uh, he and, has, and Senator, he has not Senator been, let me let me finish. He. Uh, the, the, the allegation came in weeks ago, and, and nothing was done with it by the ranking member. Uh, and then it sprung Judge, on me. Judge Kavanaugh, I've heard your, your line, and you, you say it over and over again. And uh, I have that well in mind. But let me ask you this. He authored a book titled Wasted, Tales of a Gen X Drunk. He references a Bart o. Kavanaugh vomiting in someone's car during Beach Week and then passing out. Is that you that he's talking about? Senator, uh, Mark Judge uh, was... Uh, Your knowledge is that you that he's talking about. I'll explain if you let me. Pro proceed, please. Mark Judge was a friend of ours in high school. 
who developed a very serious drinking problem, an addiction problem that lasted decades and was very difficult for him to, to escape from. And uh, he nearly died. And then he developed, then he had leukemia as well on top of it. Now, as part of his therapy or part of his coming to grips with sobriety, he wrote a book that is a fictionalized book uh, and an account. I think he picked out names of friends of ours to throw them in as kind of close to what for characters in the book. So, so you know, we, we can sit know, here. We don't know whether that's you or not. We can sit here and you like make, make fun of some guy who has an addiction. I'm not making I don't think fun that of really anybody, much uh, is Judge really Kadroff, good. I'm trying to get a straight answer from you under oath. Are you uh, Bart Kavanaugh that he's referring to? Yes or no? That's you'd it. have to ask him. Well, I agree with you there. And that's why I wish that the uh, chairman had him here under oath. Now, you talked about your yearbook. Uh, in your yearbook, uh, you talked about drinking and sexual exploits, did you not? Senator, let me, uh, let me take a step back and explain uh, high school. Uh, I was number one in the class. Freshman. I, and I thought no, 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 no. I thought only the Senate. You got this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my high school. No, no. I'm gonna talk, man, sir. I'm going to talk about my high school record if you're going to sit here and mock me. We, we, we were, I think we were all very fair to Dr. Ford. Shouldn't we be just as fair to Judge Kevin? Say. I busted my butt in academics. I w always tried to do the best I could. So I recall I finished one in the class, first in, uh, you know, freshman and junior year, right up at the top with Steve Clark and Eddie Ayala. We were always kind of in the mix. I, I played sports. I was captain of the varsity basketball team. I was wide receiver and defensive back on the football team. I ran track in the spring of 82 to try to get faster. I did my um, service projects at the school, which involved going to the soup kitchen downtown. Let me finish. And going to tutor intellectually disabled kids at the Rockville Library. Went to church. And yes, we got together with our friends. Does this reflect what you are? Does this yearbook reflect your I, focus on academics and your respect for women? That's easy, yes or no. You don't have to filibuster the answer. Does it reflect your focus on I already academics? said the yearbook in my opening statement. The yearbook the judge, is obviously... Just it, wait a minute. Uh, he's asked the question. I'll give you time to answer it. The, the yearbook, as I said in my opening statement, was something where the students and, and editors uh, made a decision to treat it, some of it as farce and some of it as exaggeration, some of it celebrating things that don't reflect the things that were really the central part of our school. Yes, we went to parties, though. Yes, of course, we went to parties, and the yearbook page uh, describes that and kind of makes fun of it. And as a you know if we want to sit here and talk about whether a supreme court nomination should be based on a high school yearbook page i think that's uh taken us to a new level of absurdity so, miss mitchell well we got a filibuster but not a single answer miss mitchell judge do you still have your uh calendar the calendars there i do i would like you to look at the july 1st entry Yes. The entry says, and I quote, go to Timmy's for skis with Judge, Tom, PJ, Bernie, and Squee? Squee. Okay. It's a what does, that's a nickname. Okay. To what does this refer and, and to whom? So uh, it first says Tobin's house workout. So that's one of the football workouts that we would have uh, that uh, Dr. Fenizio would run. Uh, for guys on the football team uh, during the summer. So we would be there. That's usually six to eight or so, kind of till near dark. Uh, and then it looks like we went over to Timmy's. You want to know their last names too? Um, I'm happy to do it. If you could just identify, uh, is, is Judge Mark Judge? It is. And is PJ, PJ Smith? It is. So... It's Tim Gaudet, Mark Judge, Tom Kane, P.J. Smith, Bernie McCarthy, Chris Garrett. 
Chris Garrett is squee. He is. Did you in your calendar routinely document social gatherings like house parties or gatherings of friends in your calendar? Yes, it, it certainly appears that way. That's what I was doing in the summer of 1982. And you can see that reflected on several of the several of the entries. If a gathering like Dr. Ford has described had occurred, would you have documented that? Yes, because I documented everything, uh, those kinds of events, even small get togethers. August 7th is another good example where I documented a small get together um, that summer. So, yes. August 7th. Um, could you read that? Uh... I think that's go to Becky's, uh, Matt, Denise. Uh, Lori, Jenny. Have you reviewed every entry that is in these calendars of May, June, July, and August of 1982? I have. Is there anything that could even remotely fit what we're talking about in terms of Dr. Ford's allegations? No. As a lawyer and a judge, uh, are you, we've talked about the FBI, are you aware that this type of offense would actually be investigated by local police? Yes, I mentioned Montgomery County Police earlier, yes. Okay. Are you aware that in Maryland there is no statute of limitations that would prohibit you being charged even if this happened in 1982? That's my understanding. Have you at any time been contacted by any members of local police agencies regarding this matter? No, ma'am. Prior to your nomination for Supreme Court, you've talked about all of the female clerks you've had and the women that you've worked with. I'm not just talking about them. I'm talking about globally. Have you ever been accused, either formally or informally, of unwanted sexual behavior? No. And when I say informally, I mean just a, a female complaints. It doesn't have to be to anybody else but you. No. Since Dr. Ford's allegation was made public, how many times have you uh, been interviewed by the committee? Uh, it's It's been a... a Three or four. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember now. It's it's been several times. Each of these new things, absurd as they are, we get on the phone and kind of go through them. So, have you submitted two interviews specifically about Dr. Ford's allegation? Yes. And what about Deborah Ramirez's allegation that yes. you waved your penis in front of her? Yes. What about Julie Swetnick's allegation that you repeatedly engaged in drugging and gang raping or allowing women to be gang raped? Yes. Yes, I've been interviewed about it. Okay. Were your answers to my questions today consistent with the answers that you gave to the committee in these various interviews? Yes, ma'am. Okay. See, I'm out of time. Senator Durbin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh, earlier today, Dr. Christine Ford sat in that same chair, and under oath, she said clearly and unequivocally that she was the victim of sexual assault at your hands. She answered our questions directly, and she didn't flinch at the prospect of submitting herself to an FBI investigation of these charges. We know, and I'm sure she's been advised by our attorneys, that a person lying to the FBI can face criminal prosecution. You have clearly and unequivocally denied that you assaulted Dr. Ford. With that statement, you must believe that there is no credible evidence or any credible witness that could prove otherwise. You started off with an impassioned statement at the beginning, and I can imagine, try to imagine, what you have been through or your family's been through, and I'm sure I wouldn't get close to it. But it was an impassioned... No, you wouldn't. I'm sure I wouldn't. It's an impassioned statement. And in the course of it, you said, I welcome any kind of investigation. I quote you. I welcome any kind of investigation. I've got a suggestion for you right now. 
turn to your left in the front row to Don McGahn, counsel to President Donald Trump. Ask him to suspend this hearing and nomination process until the FBI completes its investigation of the charges made by Dr. Ford and others and goes to bring the witnesses forward and provides that information to this hearing. I'm sure that the chairman at that point will understand that that is a reasonable request to finally put to rest these charges if they are false or to prove them if they are not. You spent two years in the White House office that approved judicial nominees. You turned to the FBI over and over and over again for their work. Let's bring them in here and now. Turn to Don McGahn and tell him it's time to get this done. An FBI investigation is the only way to answer some of these questions. So, stop, the, stop the clock. Uh, this committee is, is running this hearing. Not the White House, not Don McGahn, not even you as a nominee. Uh, we're, we are here today because Dr. Ford asked for an opportunity to hear. I know you did too as well. In fact, maybe even before she did. We're here because people wanted to be heard from charges that they all thought were unfair or activities like sexual assault was unfair. So I want to assure Senator Durbin, regardless of what you say to Senator Don McGahn, we're not suspending this hearing. Proceed to answer the question, or whatever, or if the gentleman... Uh, I'll just say this. If you, Judge Kavanaugh, turn to Don McGahn and to this committee and say, for the sake of my reputation, my family name, and to get to the bottom of the truth of this, I am not going to state be an obstacle to an FBI investigation. I would hope that all the members of the committee would join me in saying, we're going to abide by your wish wishes, and we will have that investigation. I, I welcome whatever the committee wants to do, because I'm telling the truth. I want to know what you want to do. I, I'm telling the truth. I want to know what you want to do, Judge. I'm innocent. I'm innocent of this charge. And you're prepared for an FBI investigation? They don't reach conclusions. You reach the conclusion. No, Senator. but they do investigate questions. I'm, I'm and innocent. And you can't have it both ways, Judge. You can't say here at the beginning, I wanted to hear moment, Look, I welcome thing, any kind of investigation. This thing was sprung on me. This. this thing was sprung at the last minute after being held by staff. You know, Judge, and I called for, no I called for a to, hearing immediately. If there is no truth to her charges, the FBI investigation will show that. Are you afraid that they might not? Oh, come on, Jay Whip. The FBI does not reach. Con you know, you know this is. You know that's a phony well, question because the FBI doesn't reach conclusions. So let's, they let's just go. provide the 302s. With 302s, so I can explain to people who don't know what that is. What? They just go and do what you're doing. Yeah. Ask questions and then type up a report. They don't reach the bottom this line. Morning, uh, this you, morning, I asked Dr. Ford. I asked her about this incident where she ran into Mark Judge at Safeway, and she said, "Sure, I remember it." Six or eight weeks after this occurrence. Well, someone at the Washington Post went in and took a look at Mr. Judge's book and has been able to, the run that he wrote about his addiction and his uh, alcoholism. And they have narrowed it down what they think was a period of time, six or eight weeks after the event. And he would have been working at the Safeway at that point. So the point I'm getting to is we at least can connect some dots here and get some information. Why would you resist that There's kind of dots. investigation? Why would you resist that kind of investigation? Sir, I... I welcome, I wanted the hearing last week. I'm asking about the FBI investigation. There, the committee figures out how to a ask the questions. I'll do whatever. I've been on the phone multiple times with committee counsel. I'll talk to... Judge Kavanaugh, will you support an FBI investigation right now? I, I will do whatever the committee wants to... Personally, do you think that's the best thing for us to do? You want to answer? You know, look, Senator... I've, I've, I, I've said I wanted a hearing, and I've said I was welcome anything. I'm innocent. This thing was held, held when it could have been presented in the ordinary way. It could have been held and handled confidentially at first, which was what Dr. Ford's wishes were, as I understand it, and wouldn't have caused this, like, destroyed my family like this, this effort has. I think an FBI investigation will help all of us on both sides of the issue. Be, uh, Senator Graham asked for the floor, but before he does, it seems to me that 
if you want to know something, you got the witness right here to, to ask him. And secondly, if you want an FBI report, uh, you can ask for it yourself. I've asked for FBI reports in the past, in the 38 years I've been in the Senate. Senator Graham. And are you aware that at 923, on the night of July the 9th, the day you were nominated to the Supreme Court by President Trump, Senator Schumer said, 23 minutes after your nomination, I will oppose Judge Kavanaugh's nomination with everything I have. I have a bipartisan, and I hope a bipartisan majority will do the same. The stakes are simply too high for anything less. Well, if you weren't aware of it, you are now. Did you meet with Senator Dianne Feinstein on August 20th? I did meet with Senator Feinstein. Did you know that her staff had already recommended a lawyer to Dr. Ford? I did not know that. Did you know that her and her staff had this alleg allegations for over 20 days? I did not know that at the time. If you wanted an FBI investigation, you could have come to us. What you want to do is destroy this guy's life, hold this seat open, and hope you win in 2020. You said that, not me. You've got nothing to apologize for. When you see Sotomayor and Kagan, tell them that Lindsey said all oh, because I voted for them. I would never do to them what you've done to this guy. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy. Are you a gang rapist? No. I cannot imagine what you and your family have gone through. Boy, y'all want power. God, I hope you never get it. I hope the American people can see through this sham that you knew about it and you held it. You had no intention of protecting Dr. Ford. None. She's as much of a victim as you are. God, I hate to say it because these have been my friends. But let me tell you, when it comes to this, you're looking for a fair process? You came to the wrong town at the wrong time, my friend. Do you consider this a job interview? It, it, the advice and consent role is like a job. Do you consider that you've been through a job interview? I've been through a process of advice and consent under the Constitution. Which Would you has, say you've been through hell? I, I've been through uh, hell and then some. This is not a job interview. Yeah. This is hell. This, this, this is going to destroy the ability of good people to come forward because of this crap. Your high school yearbook. You have interacted with professional women all your life, not one accusation. You're supposed to be Bill Cosby when you're a junior and senior in high school. And all of a sudden you got over it. It's been my understanding that if you drug women and rape them for two years in high school, you probably don't stop. Here's my understanding. If you lived a good life, people would recognize it, like the American Bar Association has the gold standard. His integrity is absolutely unquestioned. He is the very circumspect in his personal conduct, harbors no biases or prejudices. He's entirely ethical, is a really decent person. He is warm, friendly, unassuming. He's the nicest person, the ABA. And one thing I can tell you, you should be proud of. Ashley, you should be proud of this, that you raised a daughter who had the good character to pray for Dr. Ford. To my Republican colleagues, if you vote no, you're legitimizing the most despicable thing I have seen in my time in politics. You want this seat? I hope you never get it. I hope you're on the Supreme Court. That's exactly where you should be. And I hope that the American people will see through this charade. And I wish you well. And I intend to vote for you, and I hope everybody who's fair-minded will. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Should we let things settle a little bit after that? 
If you want to, uh, we'll take a 60 second break. No, I'm good. Okay, go ahead. I'm good. Um, one of the reasons, Mr. Kavanaugh, that we are looking at the yearbook <coughs> is that it is relatively consistent in time with the events at issue here. And because it appears to be your words, is it in fact your words on your yearbook page? We, we, we submitted things to the editors and I believe they took them. I don't know if they changed things or not, but you're you know, not aware of any changes. I'm not aware one words. way or I'm not aware one way or the other, but I'm not going to sit here and contest that to have at it. If you want to go through my yearbook. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually interested, you know, lawyers um, should be working off of common terms and understand the words that we're using. I think that's a pretty basic principle among lawyers, wouldn't you agree? It is. If you're worried about my yearbook, have at it, so, Senator. Um, let's look at uh, Beach Week Ralph Club biggest contributor. What does the word Ralph mean in that? Uh, that probably refers to uh, throwing up. I'm known to have a weak stomach and I always have. In fact, the last time I was here, you asked me about having ketchup on spaghetti. I always have had a weak stomach. I don't know that I asked about ketchup on spaghetti, you, but... You didn't. Someone did. Okay. And, and yes. this is well known. Anyone who's known me, like a lot of these people behind me, uh, have known me my whole life, know, you know, I got a weak stomach, whether it's with beer or with spicy food or anything. So the vomiting that you reference in the Ralph Club reference um, related to the consumption of alcohol. Senator, I was uh, the top of my class academically. Busted my butt in school, captain of the varsity basketball team, got into Yale College. When I got into Yale College, got into Yale Law School, forked my tail off. And did the word, Ralph, you used I in your yearbook? I already, said, I already answered the alcohol. question. If you're, yeah, yeah. Did it relate to alcohol? I like you beer. For that. I like beer. I don't know if you do. Okay. Do you like beer, Senator, or not? Um, what do you like to drink? Next one is... Senator, what do you like Judge, to drink? have you... I don't know if it's boofed or boofed. How do you pronounce that? That Judge. refers to flatulence. We were 16. Okay. <laughs> and so when uh, your friend Mark Judge said the same, put the same thing in his yearbook page back to you, he had the same meaning. It was flatulence. I don't know what he did, but that's my recollection. We want to talk about flatulence at age 16 on a yearbook page. Um, I'm game. Um, you mentioned, I think, the Renate or Renate, Renata. I don't know how you pronounce that. That's a, that's a proper name of an individual you know? Renata. Renata. It's spelled with an E at the end, R-E-N-A-T-E. Is that correct? Okay. And then after that is the word alumnius. What does the word alumnius mean in that context? I explained that in my opening statement. We, um, she was a great friend of ours. Uh, we, a bunch of us went to dances with her. She hung out with us as a group. The media circus that has been generated by this thought and reported that it referred to sex. It did not. Never had any, as she herself said on the record, any kind of sexual interaction uh, with her. And I'm sorry how that's been misinterpreted and sorry about that as I explained in my opening statement because she's a good person. And to have her name dragged through this hearing is a joke uh, and really an embarrassment. Devil's Triangle. Drinking game. How's it played? Three glasses in a triangle. And? You ever played quarters? No. Okay. It's a quarters game. Um, Anne Doherty's. As you can tell from my calendar, she had a party on the 4th of July in uh, the beach in Delaware. And there are like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Fs in front of the 4th of July. What does that signify, if anything? One of our friends, Squee, when he said the F word, starting at a young age, had kind of a wind up to the F word, kind of a f <laughs> and then the word would come out. And when we were 15, we thought that was funny. And it became an inside joke for the, how he would say, f and I won't repeat it here. 
for the F word? Referring to Georgetown versus Louisville and... Do you want to name more on the F? No, Orioles versus Red Sox. In both, you respond, who won anyway or who won that game anyway? Should we draw any conclusion that a loss of recollection associated with alcohol was involved in you not knowing who won the games that you attended? No. Uh, first of all, the Georgetown Louisville was watching it on TV, a party, and the, that's the, not inconsistent with drinking and not and remembering what happened. I'm, I'm, I'm aware. And the point of uh, both was we, in essence, were having a party and didn't pay attention to the game, even though the game was the excuse we had for getting together. I think that's a, yeah. very common. I don't know if you've been to a Super Bowl party, for example, Senator, and not paid attention to the game and just hung out with your friends. I don't know if you've done that or not, but that's what we were referring to uh, in those, those two occasions. Senator Cornett. Judge, I can't think of a more embarrassing scandal for the United States Senate since the McCarthy hearings. When the comment was about the cruelty of the process toward the people involved. And the question was asked, have you no sense of decency? And I'm afraid we've lost that at least for the time being. Do you understand you've been accused of multiple crimes? Uh, I'm, I'm painfully aware for my family and me to read about this. And breathless reporting. Of course, the, the sexual assault that Dr. Ford claims that you denied, then the claims of, of Ms. Ramirez, yeah. that not even the New York Times would report because they couldn't corroborate it. And then Stormy Daniels' lawyer released a bombshell accusing you of gang rape. All of those are crimes, are they not? They are, and I'm, I'm never going to get my reputation back. It's, it, my, my life is totally and permanently altered. Well, judge, judge, don't give up. I'm not giving American, up. The American, I, people, the American will, people are listening to this, and they will make their decision, and I think you'll come out on the right side of that decision. Well, I, I will always be a good person and try to be a good judge whatever happens but so this is not a job interview you've been accused of a crime if you have lied to the committee and the investigators that is a crime in and of itself correct that is correct so in order to vote against your nomination we would have to conclude that you are a serial liar yeah. and you have exposed yourself to legal jeopardy in the way in your interaction with this committee and the investigators isn't that correct that's, that's my understanding. You talked in your interview on, uh, with Martha McCollum the other night about a fair process. Some of my colleagues across the aisle say, well, the burden is not on the accuser because this is a job interview. The burden is on you. But you said you weren't there and it didn't happen. It's impossible for you to prove a negative. So I would just suggest that you have been accused of a crime and that a fair process under the United States Constitution and our notion of fair play means that the people who make an accusation against you have to come forward with some evidence. Isn't that part of a fair process? Yes, sir, Senator. And part of that means that if you're going to make an allegation, there needs to be corroboration. In other words, you're not guilty because somebody makes an accusation against you in this country. We're not a police state. We don't give the government that kind of power. We insist that those charges be proven by competent evidence. And I know we're not in a court. I've told my colleagues if we were in court, half of them would be in contempt of court. But you have been accused of a crime. And I believe fundamental notions of fair play and justice in our constitutional system require that if somebody's going to make that accusation against you, then they need to come forward with some corroboration not just allegations. And you're right to be angry about the delays in your ability to come here and protect your good name, because in the interim, it just keeps getting worse. It's not Dr. Ford. It's this story that not even the New York Times would report, the allegation of Ms. Ramirez. And then Stormy Daniels' lawyer, comes up with this incredible story accusing you of the most sordid and salacious conduct. 
It's outrageous. And you're right to be angry. But this is your chance to tell your story. And I hope you have a chance to tell us everything you want to tell us. But the burden is not on you to disprove the allegations made. The burden under our system, when you accuse somebody of criminal conduct, is on the person making the accusation. Now, I understand we're not, this isn't a trial, like I said, but I just wanted to make sure that we understood. It's hard to reconstruct what happened 36 years ago, and I appreciate what you said about Dr. Ford, that perhaps she has had an incident at some point in her life, and you are sympathetic to that. And But your reputation is on the line, and I hope people understand the gravity of the charges made against you and what a fair process looks like. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, um, we're talking here about decency, and, and you understand we have this constitutional duty to advise and consent. Um, and for me, when this evidence came forward, um, I decided that I needed to look at this, and I needed to find out about it, and I needed to ask you questions about it, as well as others that were involved. So. Again, I'm not going to take quite the same approach as my colleagues here and talk about Don McGahn or any of this. Why don't you just ask the president? Mrs. Dr. Ford can't do this. We clearly haven't been able to do this. But just ask the president to reopen the FBI investigation. I think the committee is doing, you're doing the investigation. I'm here to answer your questions. No. And, and I should say one thing, Senator Klobuchar, which is um, I appreciate uh, our meeting together, and I appreciate how you handled the prior hearing, and I have a lot of respect for you. Well, thank you. All of that aside, here's the thing. You could actually just get this open so that we can talk to these witnesses, and the FBI can do it instead of us. And you've come before us, but we have people like um, Mark Judge, who uh, Dr. Ford says was a witness to this. We have this polygraph expert uh, that my colleagues were raising issues about the polygraph. We would like to have that person come before us. And I just think but if we could open this up. I don't mean, um, to, I don't mean to interrupt, but I guess I am. But uh, Mark Judge has provided sworn statements saying this didn't happen and that I never did or would do. But we would like the FBI to be able to follow up and ask him questions. You know, um, we talked about past nomination processes and you talked about uh, those and I note that President George Bush um, in the Anita Hill um, Justice Thomas case uh, he opened up the FBI investigation and let questions being asked um, and I think it was helpful for people so was his decision reasonable? I, I don't know the circumstances of that. What I know, Senator Zom, he, 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 he just, the circumstances are that he opened up the investigation so the FBI could ask some questions. Uh, That's what he, he opened up the background check. I'm here to answer questions about my yearbook or about, you know, what I, okay. That's, my sports I, or, you know, okay. I'm not gonna ask. Okay, I'm not going to ask about the yearbook. Um, so most people have done some drinking in high school and college, um, and many people even struggle with alcoholism and binge drinking. Um, my own dad struggled with alcoholism most of his life, and uh, he got in trouble for it, and there were consequences. Uh, he is still in AA at age 90, and he's sober. Uh, and in his words, he was pursued by grace, and that's how he got through this. So in your case, uh, you have said um, here and other places that you never drank so much uh, that you didn't remember what happened. But yet we have heard, not under oath, but we have heard your college roommate say that you did drink frequently. These are in re news reports uh, that you would sometimes be belligerent. Um, another classmate said it's not credible for you to say you didn't have memory lapses. So drinking is one thing. I don't. Th but I actually don't think that's the second quote's correct. On the first quote, if you want to, I provided some material that's still redacted about the situation with the freshman year roommate, and I don't really want to repeat that in a public hearing. But just so you know, there were three people in a room: Dave White, Jamie Roach, and me, and it was a 
contentious situation where Jamie did not like Dave White. I was at all. And I mean, this. OK, I could, so, Dave, I just, so Dave White came back from from the home one weekend and Jamie Roach had moved all his furniture okay, okay. out into the out into the courtyard. OK. And so he walks in. And so that's your source on that. Okay. So there's some so old drinking is one thing. And, there, and there's much more. Okay. And look at the redacted port portion okay. of what I said. I don't want to repeat all that right. in a public hearing. I will. The I will. Could I just ask one more question? Redacted information about that. OK. Drinking is one thing, but the concern is about truthfulness. And in your written testimony, you said sometimes you had too many drinks. Uh, was there ever a time when you drank so much that you couldn't remember what happened or part of what happened the night before? No, I, I, no, I remember what happened. And I think you've probably had beers, Senator, and, and so far. So you're saying there's never been a case where you drank so much that you didn't remember what happened the night before or part of what happened? That's, you're asking about, yeah, blackout. I don't know. Have you? It, could you answer the question, Judge? I just, so you, that's not happened. Is that your answer? Yeah, and I'm curious if you have. I have no drinking problem, Judge. Yeah, nor do I. Okay, thank you. Senator Hatch, since this FBI thing keeps coming up all the time, let's get back to basics. First of all, anybody, including any senator that's brought up this issue, could ask for an FBI investigation. Uh, what the FBI does is gather information for the White House, then the files sent to the committee for us to make our own evaluations. We're capable of making our own determination about the accuracy of any of those allegations. The FBI has put out a statement over, uh, now I suppose it's a month ago, clearly stating this matter is closed as far as, as uh, the, the letter being sent to them. And there is no federal crime to investigate. Uh, if uh, Senator, uh, Senate Democrats hope for the FBI to draw any conclusions on this matter, I'm going to remind you what Joe Biden said. Now, I said this in my statement, but maybe, uh, maybe people aren't listening when I say and Maybe they won't even hear this. Joe Biden, quote, the next person who refers to an FBI report as being worth anything obviously doesn't understand anything. The FBI explicitly does not, does not in this or any other case reach a conclusion, period. They say, he said, she said, they said, period. So when people wave an FBI report before you, or even bring it up now as something prospectively, I'm not, uh, that wasn't in his quote, understand they do not, they do not, they do not reach conclusions. They do not make recommendations. Senator Hatch. Mr. Chairman. Need a break. Oh, no, no, don't break. Mr. Let me, Chairman. Let me do this. May I say for the record that actually we have asked, you said that nobody's asked the FBI or we could ask the FBI. I actually have, I think others have, and I think that the issue is that part of what an FBI report does is to investigate and seek either corroborating or exculpatory evidence. It's not so much the conclusion that it draws as the breadth of the evidence that is sought out through the investigation and the difference between what somebody might say to an FBI agent when they're being examined and, for instance, Mr. Okay. Judge's letter signed by his lawyer sent in, it's, a, it's just a different thing. And I believe still that this is the first background investigation in the history of background investigations that hasn't been reopened when new credible derogatory information was raised about the uh, subject, about the nominee. So, I, you know, I just... The didn't point. want to let the point you made stand okay. without well, I'll, I'll, referencing I'll, the, what we had tried to do. Uh, pardon me, but I'll just add to the point you made. The letter was sent to the FBI. The FBI sent it to the White House with a letter saying the case is closed. We're taking a break now. Senator, uh, we're taking a break now.
Judge Kavanaugh, I'm getting ready now for this Judge, new round of questioning. I am ready. And can I say one thing? Yes. Just going to say, I uh, started my last colloquy by saying to Senator Klobuchar how much I respect her and respected what she did at the last hearing. And she asked me a question at the end that I responded by asking her a question. And I didn't, sorry, I did that. This is a tough process. I'm sorry about that. I appreciate that. I, I would like to add when you have a parent that's an alcoholic, uh, you're pretty careful about drinking. And, um, and the second thing is I was truly just trying to get to the bottom of the facts and the evidence. And I, again, believe we do that by opening up the FBI investigation. And I would call it a background check instead of investigation. Thank you. Appreciate that. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, Judge. Welcome. We're happy to have you here. Uh, my friend from, uh, uh, I'd just like to say a few words. My friend from Arizona emphasized yesterday that we have before us today two human beings, Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. They deserve, each of you deserves to be treated fairly and respectfully. We tried to do that with Dr. Ford earlier, and I think we succeeded. It's important that we treat Judge Kavanaugh fairly now, and it remains to be seen how that's going to work out. Judge Kavanaugh has been a federal judge for 12 years, and he's been a great federal judge on the second highest court in the nation. He's earned a reputation for fairness and decency. His clerks love him. His students, he teaches in law school as well, his students love him. His colleagues love him. This man is not a monster, nor is he what has been represented here in these hearings. We're talking today about Judge Kavanaugh's conduct in high school. And even then, and as a freshman in college, I guess, as well. Serious allegations have been raised. If Judge Kavanaugh committed sexual assault, he should not serve on the Supreme Court. I think we'd all agree with that. But the circus atmosphere that has been created since my Democratic colleagues first leaked Dr. Ford's allegations to the media two weeks ago, after sitting on them for six weeks, I might add, has brought us the worst in our politics. It certainly has brought us no closer to the truth. Anonymous letters with no name and no return address are now being treated as national news. Porn star lawyers with facially implausible claims are driving the news cycle. I hate to say this, but this is worse than Robert Bork, and I didn't think it could get any worse than that. This is worse than Clarence Thomas. I didn't think it could get any worse than that. This is a national disgrace, the way you're being treated. And in the middle of it all, we have Judge Kavanaugh, a man who until two weeks ago was a uh, pillar of the legal community. There's been no whisper of misconduct by him in the time he's been a judge. What we have are uncorroborated, unsubstantiated claims from his teenage years. Claims that every alleged eyewitness has either denied or failed to corroborate. I do not mean to minimize the seriousness of the claims. Yeah, they've been serious claims, but... The search for truth has to involve more than bare assertions. Like Dr. Ford, Judge Kavanaugh deserves fair treatment. He was an immature high schooler. So were we all. That he wrote or said stupid things sometimes does not make him a sexual predator. I understand the desire of my colleagues to tear down this man at any cost. I do understand it. But let's at least be fair and look at the facts or the absence thereof. Guilt by association is wrong. Immaturity does not equal criminality. The Judge Kavanaugh drank in high school or college does not make him guilty of every terrible thing that he's recently been accused of. A lifetime of respect and equal treatment ought to mean something when assessing allegations that are flatly inconsistent with the course of a person's entire adult life. With those comments, Judge, I'd just like to ask you a few questions. If I can, about how, and if you can be short in your answers, it helped help me get through a bunch of them, about how this process has unfolded. When did you first learn of Dr. Ford's allegations against you? Uh, it was a week ago Sunday when Washington Post story. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> did the ranking member raise these allegations in your one-on-one -on -one meeting with her last month? She did not. Did the ranking member raise them at your public hearing earlier this month? 
now. Did the ranking member raise them at the closed session that followed the public hearing? She was not there. Did the ranking member or any of her colleagues raise them in the 1,300 written questions that were submitted to you following the hearing? No. When was the first time that the ranking member or her staff asked you about these allegations? Uh, today. When did you first hear of Ms. Ramirez's allegations against you? Uh, in the last, in the period since then, in the New Yorker story. Did the ranking member or any of her colleagues or any of their staffs ask you about Ms. Ramirez's allegations before they were leaked to the press? No. When was the first time that the ranking member or any of her colleagues or any of their staff asked you about Ms. Ramirez's allegations? Today. I think it's a disgrace between Senator them. Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Kavanaugh, um, today's hearing is about Dr. Ford's uh, serious allegations about sexual assault. Uh, you have unequivocally uh, denied those claims, um, but we're here today to assess um, her credibility and yours. Uh, and in our uh, previous vigorous exchanges and the uh, previous confirmation hearing rounds, uh, I, I found that your answers um, at times vigorously defended, but at other times um, struck me as evasive or not credible on key issues. And it's against that backdrop that I'm seeking to assess your credibility today. Um, you said in your opening that rule of law means taking allegations seriously, um, and I agree with that. It brings me no joy to question you on these topics today, but I do think they're serious and I think they are worthy of our attention. Um, so let me, if I can, uh, return to a line of questioning uh, my colleague was on before, um, which was about whether you've ever gotten aggressive while drinking or forgotten an evening um, after drinking. Those are two different questions. Uh, I've already answered the second one as to the first. Uh, I think the answer to that is basically no. I don't know really what you mean by that. Like, wh what are you talking about? Well, uh, the, the I reason I, I, mean, I... I don't mean it that way, but uh, no is the basic answer, unless you're talking about something where that I, I'm not aware of that you're going to ask about. The, the reason I'm asking, um, we've had a very brief period of time to weigh outside evidence, and uh, I'll join my colleagues in saying... Uh, I wish we had more evidence in front of us today to weigh. Um, do you remember Liz Swisher, a college classmate of yours from Yale? Uh, first on their point about the outside evidence, uh, you know, all four witnesses well, let, said... Let me focus. I'm trying to get this question. I know, but you made, a, you made a point. I just want to reemphasize. All four witnesses who are allegedly at the event have said it didn't happen, including... Dr. Ford's longtime friend, Ms. Kaiser, right. who said she's Mark never... Judge, if Mark Judge were in front of us today to question, we'd be able to assess his credibility. But Let me just get through this through, if I can, Your Honor. He, but... uh, Liz Swisher is a college classmate. She's now a medical doctor. Um, and I'm quoting uh, from a recent interview she gave. Um, she said um, Brett Kavanaugh um, drank more than a lot of people. He'd end up slurring his words, stumbling. It's not credible for him to say he's had no memory lapses in the nights he drank to excess. I know because I drank with him. Um, how should we assess that? She then goes her? on, if you, if you kept reading, and says she actually can't point to any specific instance like that. Um, the quote that jumped out at me was, Brett was a sloppy drunk, and I know because I drank with him. Um, there's also... I don't think that... I, don't, I, I do not think that's a fair characterization. Um, and Chris Dudley's quoted in that article. And I would refer you to what Chris Dudley said. I spent more time with Chris Dudley in college than just about anyone. And I'd refer you to what he said. In other reporting, as I'm sure you know, a college classmate described you as relatively shy, but said that when you drank, you could be aggressive or even belligerent. And your roommate, as I think you discussed with Senator you, you should, Klobuchar, said yeah. you were frequently drunk. Yeah, or, and, that, and that roommate, that was freshman year roommate. Yes. And there was contention between him and the third person. There were three of us in a small room. And you should look at what I said in the redacted portion of the, tr of the transcript about him. And you should assess his credibility with that in mind. Um, put yourself in our shoes for a moment, if you would, Judge, and I know that's asking a lot of you in this setting. Um, but suppose you'd gone through a process um, to select someone for an incredibly important job in a position. You had a lot of qualified candidates, and as you're finishing the hiring process, 
you learn of a credible allegation that, if true, would be disqualifying. Um, wouldn't you either take a step back and conduct a thorough investigation um, or move to a different candidate? And why not agree to a one-week pause to allow the FBI to investigate all these allegations and allow you an opportunity a week from now to have the folks present in front of us for us to assess their credibility and for us to either clear your name or resolve these allegations by moving to a different nominee. All four witnesses who are alleged to be at the event said it didn't happen, including oh. Dr. Ford's longtime friend, Ms. Kaiser, who said that she didn't know me and that she does not recall ever being at a party with me with or without Dr. Ford. What I've struggled with, Judge Kavanaugh, is the absence of a fair federal law enforcement driven nonpartisan process to question the various people who I think are critical to this. My concern, should you move forward, is what it will do um, to the credibility of the court uh, and how that may well hang over um, your service. I understand Look, your concern Senator, yeah, about this. Senator, my, my I wish you would join been... us in calling for an FBI investigation for one week you, when to you... clear or confirm some of these allegations. When you say a week delay, do you know how long the last 10 days have been for yeah, us? Probably an eternity. But yeah. in the Judge Thomas conference, yeah, for us, hearing, every day, it's a four day delay. Every day, it's been a lifetime. And, and you know, yeah, and, and it's been investigated. And all four witnesses say it didn't happen. And they've said it under penalty of felony. And I've produced my calendars, which show. Uh, you know, a lot. That's a very that's important evidence, and you act like I mean, every, ten, the last ten days I asked for a hearing the day after the allegation. Uh, before I call on Senator Lee, I want to emphasize something here that uh, talking about doing something without enough time. We had 45 days between July 30th. And September the 13th, I believe it is, when we could have been investigating this. And in regard to this candidate, if you take the average of 65 to 70 days between the time that, that a person is not announced by the president and the Senate votes on it, is about 65 to 70 days. And here we are at about 85 to 90 days. So there's plenty of time put in on this nomination. Senator Lee. Oh, no, wait a minute. I got one other thing I want to do. <laughs> Everybody else has been putting letters in the, in the record. I have a letter here from 65 women who knew Judge Kavanaugh between the years 79 and 83, the years he attended Georgetown Prep High School. These women wrote to the committee because they know Judge Kavanaugh and they know that the allegations raised by Dr. Ford are completely, totally inconsistent with his character. These 65 women know him through social events and church. Many have remained close friends with him. Here's what they say, uh, partly quoting the letter. Quote, through the more than 35 years we've known him, Brett has stood out for his friendship, character, and integrity. He has always treated women with decency and respect. That was true in high school and it remains true to this day. In closing, they wrote, Judge Kavanaugh, quote, has always been a good person. So without objection, I put it in the record, Senator Lee. Judge Kavanaugh, you've been cooperative at every stage of this investigation, both your background investigation and the investigation conducted by this committee. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. It's also correct that you yourself do not control the FBI or when it conducts an investigation. You were a nominee. You're not tasked with the job of deciding who, when, whether, or how conducts an investigation. That, that's correct. But at every moment when either we or, or, or prior to the committee taking jurisdiction over it, the FBI has asked you questions, you've been attentive and you've been responsive. Isn't that right? That's correct. Throughout my career. I have colleagues today who have repeatedly asked for an FBI investigation. And there are some ironies in this. Ironies that, that uh, ascend at least two levels. In the first place, at least one of my colleagues, at least one of them, had access to this information many, many weeks before anyone else did, had the ability, and I believe the moral duty and obligation, to report those facts to the FBI, at which point they could have and would have been investigated by the FBI. 
And that could have been handled in such a way that didn't turn this into a circus, one that has turned your life upside down and that of your family and the life of Dr. Ford and her family upside down. I consider this most unfortunate, given that this was entirely within the control of at least one of my Democratic colleagues to do this. The second level of irony here is that while calling repeatedly for an investigation by the FBI, an investigation over which you have no ability to control, by the way, an investigation you have no authority to call for, while calling for an investigation, we're in the middle of a conversation that involves questions to you. And so I ask my Democratic colleagues, if you have questions for Judge Kavanaugh, ask him. He's right here. If that's really what you want is the truth, ask him questions right now. If you have questions of other witnesses, then for the love of all that is sacred and holy, participate in the committee investigations that have been going on, as you have not been participating, with the committee staff investigating the outside witnesses. If someone really were interested in the truth, this is what they would do. They would participate in the investigation, and when we have a committee investigation, a committee hearing with live witnesses, they would talk about that rather than something else they wish they were having in front of them. If what they want is a search for the truth, then now is their choice. If, on the other hand, what they want to do is delay this until after the election, which at least one of my colleagues on the Democratic side has acknowledged, then that might be what they would do. Finally, I want to point out that there is significant precedent from our former chairman of this committee, Chairman Joe Biden. During the Clarence Thomas hearings nearly three decades ago, Chairman Biden made some interesting observations about FBI reports and their role in this process. Here's what he said, quote, the next person who refers to an FBI report as being worth anything obviously doesn't understand anything. The FBI explicitly does not, in this or any other case, reach a conclusion, period, period. Those are his dual periods, not mine. I continue the quote. The reason why we cannot rely on the FBI report, you would not like it if we did, because it is inconclusive. So when people wave an FBI report before you, understand they do not. They do not. They do not reach conclusions. They do not make, as my friend points out more accurately, they do not make recommendations. In other words, the role of the FBI is to flag issues. Those issues have been flagged. Sadly, in this case, they were flagged not as they should have been, not in the timing in which they should have been. And therefore, they couldn't have been addressed in, in the manner that would have preserved a lot more dignity for you, for your family, and for Dr. Ford and her family. They were instead held out until the final moment. I consider that most unfortunate. And for that, on behalf of this committee, I extend to you my most profound sympathies and my most profound sympathies to Dr. Ford and her family as well. Mr. Chairman, uh, since we don't have enough slots for everyone, can I have the last minute of Senator Lee so that Senator Kennedy can be recognized? Judge, um, we did 38 hours in public with you. Did we have any private hearings with you? Uh, yes. Uh, was that a fun time for you when people and senators could ask questions that are awkward or uncomfortable about potential alcoholism, potential gambling addiction, credit card debt, uh, if your buddies floated you money to buy baseball tickets. Did you enjoy that time we spent in here late one night? Uh, I'm ha always happy to cooperate with the committee. <laughs> That's charitable. Um, were you ever asked about any sexual allegations when we had that time in here with you alone? No. Did the ranking member already have these allegations for, I guess this would have been September 6 or 7? And the letter was written on July 30th. A, uh, a recommendation was made by the ranking member or her staff to uh, Dr. Ford. And by the way, I think Dr. Ford is a victim. And I think she's been through hell. And I'm very sympathetic to her. Um, but did the ranking member's staff, did we hear today, make a recommendation to hire a lawyer and she knew all of that? And yet we had a hearing here with you and none of these things were asked. But then once the process was closed, once the FBI investigation was closed, once we were done meeting in public and in private, then this was sprung on you. I just want to make sure I have the, the dates correct, right? Because we got 35 plus days from all the time that this evidence was in the hands. Recommendations were made to an outside lawyer. You could have handled all this. We could have had this conversation in private in a way that didn't not only do crap to his family, but do all... I yield my time.
I was trying to see if he could do math about 35 days. That was a little bit of a question. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, as a federal judge, you're aware of the jury instruction, falsus in, in unibus, falsus in omnibus. Are you not? You're aware of that jury instruction? Yeah, I, I am. You know what it means. You can translate it for me, Senator. You can do it better than I can. False in one thing, false in everything, meaning in jury instructions that we, some of us as prosecutors, have heard many times, is told a jury that they can disbelieve a witness if they find him to be false in one thing. So the core of why we're here today really is credibility. Uh, let me talk. The core of why we're here is an allegation for which the four witnesses present have all said it didn't happen. Let me ask you about Renata Dolphin, who lives in Connecticut. She thought these yearbook statements were, quote, horrible, hurtful, and simply untrue, end quote, because Renata alumni clearly implied some boast of sexual conquest. And that's the reason that you apologized to her, correct? Uh, that's false, speaking uh, about the, the yearbook. And she, she said she and I never had any sexual interaction. So your, right. question, your question is false. And I've uh, addressed that in the opening statement. And so your question is based on a false premise and really does great harm to her. I don't know why you're bringing this up, frankly. Doing great harm to her by even bringing her name up here is really unfortunate. Well, calling someone an alumnus in that way. Well, implying what you're implying about by a number of your football friends at the time as boasting of sexual conflict. Uh, the, That's the reason that I'm bringing it up. And yeah, no, it's like, false. You're implying with, that. Look what you're bringing up right now about her. Look what you're Mr. doing. Chairman, I ask that Don't these interruptions not be subtracted from my time. Yeah, ask your question and then let She's a great person. She's always been a great person. We never had any sexual interaction. By bringing this up, you're just just dragging her through the mud. It's just unnecessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you made reference, Judge, to a sworn statement, I believe, by Mark Judge to the committee. Is that correct? I made reference to what Mark Judge's uh, lawyer sent to the committee. Yeah, it's not a sworn statement, is it? Or, uh, under penalty of felony? Well, it's a statement signed by his lawyer, Barbara Van Gelder. It is six cursory and conclusory sentences. Are you saying that that is a substitute for an investigation by the FBI? Or some interview by the FBI under oath? Under penalty of felony, he said that this kind of event didn't happen and that I never did or would have done something like that. As a and federal judge, you always want the best evidence, don't you? Senator, he has said, and all the witnesses present, look at Ms. Kaiser's statement. She's, she's stuck let me, let me move on to another her. topic. You've testified to this committee this morning this afternoon, quote, this whole two-week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit fueled with apparent pent-up anger about President Trump and the 2016 election, fear that has been unfairly stoked about my judicial record, revenge on behalf of the Clintons, and millions of dollars in money from outside left-wing opposition groups. Is it your testimony that the motivation of the courageous woman who sat where you did just a short time ago was revenge on behalf of a left-wing conspiracy or the Clinton? Senator, I said in my opening statement that she preferred confidentiality. And her confidentiality was, was destroyed by the actions of this committee. Let me ask you this. In a speech that you gave at Yale, you, you described, quote, falling out of the bus 
onto the front steps of the Yale Law School at 445 a.m. I wasn't, and I wasn't then describing me. I organized, to, Senator, Senator, let me finish here, please. I organized a uh, third year end of school party for 30 of my classmates to rent a bus to go to Fenway Park in Boston, which was about a three hour trip. I bought all the tickets. You and I have discussed that before. Uh, I bought all the baseball tickets. I rented the bus. I organized the whole trip. We went to Fenway Park. Roger Pitt Clemens was pitching for the Red Sox. We had a great time. George Brett was playing third base for the Royals. Actually, he was playing left field that night. And he and we went to the game and got back, and then we went out. It was a great night of friendship. I, I apologize for interrupting, Judge, but I need to finish the quote before I ask you the question. I wasn't the talking quote about ends. Me. Okay, well, the uh, quote ends that you tried to, quote, piece things back together end quote, to recall what happened that night. Meaning? I know what happened. Well, you... Uh, judge, let it, let, uh, will you quickly answer your question, and then I'm going to let him answer I know what I know what happened that I'll night. I'll finish asking my question. So please, please, go ahead, but do it quickly. Doesn't that imply to you that you had to piece things back together? You had to ask others what happened that night? No. It, okay, you, you take your time now and answer the question. Yeah. Then Senator Craig. Uh, definitely not. I know exactly what happened that night. It was a great night of fun. I was so happy that it was great camaraderie. Everyone looks back fondly on the trip to Fenway Park. And then we went out together, a group of classmates, and I know exactly what happened the whole night. And I'm happy. Judge, do you, be do you believe Anita Hill? Senator, Senator Crapo. Uh, Senator Crapo. Uh, Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Judge Kavanaugh, uh, first, I want to get into this whole question that's been bandied back and forth here almost endlessly today about uh, the FBI investigation process. Um, because I think it's, I, I want to follow up a little bit on what Senator Lee and Senator Sass have referenced. Um, there's been a lot of talk here about we need an FBI investigation. Uh, in these processes, which you've been through a number of times now, when the FBI does a background check with regard to a nomination, uh, could you quickly describe that for us? What does the FBI do? The FBI gathers statements from people who have information. They don't resolve credibility. They gather the information, and the credibility determination is made by the ultimate fact finder, which in this case is the United States Senate. The committee, of course, here has gathered uh, evidence. And the FBI then gives that uh, report to the White House, if I understand it, and the White House then transfers it to the Senate. Is that the, the That's my understanding, yes. And as you indicated, it does not do, and it's been said many times here today, the FBI does not make judgments. It gives the Senate committee information. At that point in time, uh, if I understand the process correctly, the Senate, the United States Senate Judiciary Committee has legal authorities if it receives information in an FBI report that it wants to further investigate, the Senate has legal authority to conduct further investigation. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And that is what has been referenced here many times about how some of these witnesses that were identified in the very late information that we received have made statements that are under penalty of felony. That's a felony for lying to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And as I understand it, what happens is the Senate Judiciary Committee, which has authority under law to conduct those kinds of investigations, follows up on the FBI reports to finish out the investigation that it wants with regard to any information that it receives that needs further investigation. Is that your understanding of the process? That's my understanding, Senator. Now, in this case, there's been a lot of talk here today, and if I have time, I'll get into it. It looks like I'll run out of time. But in this case, there's a lot of concern by many that there was not so much an interest in an FBI investigation as there was in delay. I'm not going to get to that unless I have time. I want to talk about what happened in the Senate committee's investigation. Because as I understand it, and this may be more of a question to the chairman, as soon as we received information, which was about 45 days after others on the committee received it, we conducted an investigation. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry to turn the question to you, but we began that legal Senate Judiciary Committee investigation. Yes. And that investigation involved our fully, lawfully 
uh, enabled investigators to conduct an investigation. And if I understand it correctly, the Democratic members of the committee refused to participate in that investigation. Yes. And so we have conducted the investigation. The very kinds of things that my colleagues on the other side are asking that we tell the FBI to do, this committee has the authority to do it, and this committee does it, and this committee has done it. Now, there may be more demands for more interviews and more investigation, but when you, Judge Kavanaugh, have referenced the testimony that has come from those who were supposed, who were identified as, as being at this event, um, the testimony that has been received from them is information that has been received pursuant to a Senate committee investigation. And I just think it should be made clear. I think there's been a lot of back and forth here about, oh, we're not getting information, we're not looking at this, you don't want to look into the investigation, you don't want to see what happened. The reality is that this committee immediately and thoroughly investigated every witness that has been identified to us, and we have statements under penalty of felony from them. Um, so I just want to conclude with that. I got 45 seconds left, so I'm going to just ask you one quick question again on timing. Uh, you had a meeting with Senator Feinstein on August 20th. It's my understanding. Yeah, well, I had a meeting, and that's my understanding of the date. Of the date, yes. What was established earlier in testimony here today was that um, the ranking member's staff uh, helped to helped uh, Dr. Ford to retain the Katz Law Firm on uh, sometime between August or July 30th and August 7th. So I just wanted you to clarify one more time. In the meeting that you had two weeks or more later, this issue was not raised with you. The issue was not raised. All right, thank you, my time's up. We'll take a five minute break now. <clears throat> Good. Uh, Senator Rona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Kavanaugh, my colleagues on the other side are accusing the Democrats of some sort of political conspiracy, but that's because they want us to distract. They want to distract us from what happened here this morning. And what happened here this morning was that we heard from Dr. Christine Ford, who spoke to us with quiet, raw, emotional power about what happened to her. She said she was 100% certain that it was you who attacked her. And she explained how she came forward, how she struggled with her decision, how she wanted the president to know so that he could make a better choice. So when you and my colleagues on the other side accuse us of ambushing, ambushing you with false charges, I think we all have to remember Dr. Ford's testimony and her courage. Let me go back to something you just uh, said in your opening. You said you thought at your first hearing the Democrats were an embarrassment. We asked you a lot of questions in those days. And which of our questions do you think were an embarrassment? I asked you about dissents you had written as a judge, an amicus brief you wrote as a lawyer, and your knowledge of sexual harassment and abuse by your close friend and mentor, Alex Kozinski. All valid questions in the setting. They are valid because this is a job interview for one of the most important positions of trust in this country. And earlier you agreed that this process of advice and consent is really a job interview. Certainly not a criminal trial. There's certainly no entitlement for you to be confirmed to the Supreme Court. Our credibility, character, and candor of a nominee things for us to consider in your job interview? I think my whole life is uh subject to consideration. Is that yes? Credibility, character, and my, candor. My whole Are life those specific traits that would be of interest to us as we consider putting you for life on the highest court in the country. Credibility, character, and candor. Uh, of course, and as part of my whole life. Is temperament also an important trait for us to consider? For 12 years, everyone who's appeared before me on the D.C. Circuit has praised my judicial temperament. That's why I have the well, unanimous, well-qualified rating from the American Bar Association and all the people who have appeared so before you. So you would agree that temperament is also an uh, important factor for Yes, and my, the, the federal public defender who testified to the committee um, talked about how I had I uh, was always open-minded and how I'd ruled in favor of unpopular defendants, how I was fair-minded. I think universally lawyers who've appeared before 
of the DC. So the answer is yes. I am running out of time. You know, we only have five minutes. So uh, let me get to something else. In your Fox News interview, you said that you quote always treated women with dignity and respect end quote, and that in high school you never quote drank so much that you couldn't remember what happened the night before. Would you say the same thing about your college life? Yes. So I'd like to read your statements from people who knew you in college. Sarah, and can I Senator say one thing? noted yeah. that James Roche said, your roommate, although Brett was normally reserved, he was a notably heavy drinker, even by the standards of the time, and he became aggressive and belligerent when he was drunk. So is your former college roommate lying? Uh, I would refer you to what I said in the sealed or redacted portion about his relationship with the other two roommates, and I'm going to leave it at that. I will say, Senator, you're asking about college. Um, I got into Yale Law School. That's the number one law school in the country. I had no connections there. I got there by busting my tail in I feel college. insulted as a Georgetown graduate. It's, excuse me? <laughs> Go on. I'm sorry. Uh, it's ranked number one. That doesn't mean it's number one. Um, and, you know, in college, number, two things. A, I studied. I was in cross-campus library every night. And B, I played basketball for the junior varsity. I tried out for the varsity. With, uh, the first day I arrived on campus, we had captain's workouts. I played basketball every day all through. And then as soon as the season was over in late February, captain's workouts started again. I was obsessed with so being you the were not a basketball I'm, player. I only have 23 seconds. So you were not as a uh, sloppy drunk, and so your roommate was lying. I, refer you, I will refer you again to the redacted portion. I'll say... Look at my academic record, and I don't usually like to talk about myself this way, but in response to you, you know, I, I, I worked very hard in college in my studies, and I also played uh, basketball, I did sports, and I also okay, did wait. socialize. Excuse me, I know that the chairman is going to stop me, but I do have some other references from people who knew you who say that uh, you were not the uh, uh, your, basic your fire board, but hold on. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator, Mr. Chairman. Senator, tell us. I would like to, Mr. Chairman, okay, I'll wait until we finish because I just want to enter some oh, letters could, into yes. the record. Could I, I do wasn't that? wasn't clear that's it's what you question. were doing. I could go on. But, um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record four letters. One is dated September 18th, 2018, to you from all of the Democrats on this committee. Another is another is a letter dated September 18th to Christopher Ray, the director of the FBI, and Don McGahn, counsel to the president, signed by all the Democrats on this committee. A September 21st letter signed by Chuck Schumer and Diane Feinstein to the president, and a September 26th letter signed by all the Democrats on this committee, all requesting an FBI investigation, <laughs> because you did say all we have to do is ask, and the implication being that if we ask, an investigation will happen, and it certainly has not happened. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without Kermit. objection, th that will be included. Senator, tell us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Judge Kavanaugh. Thank you again for being here, and I apologize for uh, what you're going through right now. I can't imagine. And I've gone through a campaign and had a lot of smears, but it pales in comparison to what you've had to deal with. Um, I, I think one thing, uh, one point that I'd like to make from the onset, if we go back and review how this committee process has worked, we've got a lot of work to do. We've had members take it on themselves to release committee confidential documents instead of respecting the process. We've had an allegation held for nearly seven weeks that would have given us plenty of time to investigate. And then when we finally got the information, I invite everybody, particularly the American public, there is an investigation going on. And a lot of it's been documented. There's a chronology on the website that says that each and every time an allegation was made, the staff followed up on it. And sadly, in several different instances, the Democrats declined to participate. They listened in on at least one interview with you, didn't ask a single question. If they wanted to find other leads and other things to do, why not ask? If you're really trying to get to the facts, if you're really trying to do your job to investigate, we're investigating. It's our job. I think in response to the ranking member's question that uh, Judge Kavanaugh said, I'm here, you're asking me questions. But you know what? When the committee staff 
I assume, directed by the ranking member, says, no, we're not going to ask questions of Judge Kavanaugh when he wanted to come in and clear his good name. What are you really after? You may not be after the truth. Maybe you are. Maybe you're after executing some sort of a political agenda. Maybe it's a mix of both. But I think you've been treated unfairly, and I'm amazed that after 32 hours of testimony, one and a half hours I sat in this room, that none of these questions came up when it was all fully known. Lawyered up, as a matter of fact. I also want to go back to the comments this morning. I think I heard, and we can go back to the record if someone disagrees with me, I think I heard Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Ford say, that she wasn't aware of the fact that we said we'd come to California, we'd make it confidential, we'll completely depose and ask any questions you want to. I think I heard her say she wasn't aware of that. I don't know where that came with counsel or not, whether counsel just neglected to tell her, her counsel, but the fact of the matter is that offer was out there. We were moving heaven and earth and even moving the schedule to get to the truth. We're doing an investigation. We're doing our level best. I hope that the American people who are watching this will go out to the, the Senate Judiciary website and take a look at this chronology. Take a look at the lack of investigation on the part of the people who want the investigation. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Every opportunity you have to go and question a witness, every opportunity that we've had to find more truth, to find more facts, we've done it. It's documented. We've got sworn statements. We're doing our job. We're doing the committee work. Judge Kavanaugh, I um, also have to say, I believe that you're a part of, you're the first major target of a new strategy that's developed here. And I think you're right. I think it's just basically attack, attack, attack. It's not advising consent. It's search and destroy. And maybe one of the best evidence of this is one of the websites, one of the groups that are out there attacking you and trying to create fodder and all of these red herrings has already acquired a URL for the next judge that they're going to attack. The URL's right here. They've already purchased it. They're ready to go. This is the playbook. This is the way we're going to run this committee from this point forward. Take a look at it. I'll, I'll make sure we get it out on our website. We've already got a stop another judge who hasn't been nominated URL from the same people that are trying to mobilize people to attack you. There are some people here who may sincerely have concerns. I would tell you to pound the table with your ranking member and the leadership on your side to say, why didn't we ask questions? Why did we listen in and defer? Why didn't we do our part of the investigation while this leader did everything he could to accommodate Dr. Ford and to run down every single lead that's been presented to us weeks after it was known to the minority? I look forward to supporting your confirmation. I believe that you're going to be on the bench. You know, as, as Senator Cornyn said, these are allegations that can be pursued through the courts if they actually rise to a level to where they can be prosecuted. And everybody on the other side of this dais knows that that's not going to happen. Senator Barker. Judge Kavanaugh, um, you drink on weekdays as well in high school, not just weekends. Is that on weekdays? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd say that's rare. Are you talking about during the school year? I'm talking about the calendars that you provided during these dates. Oh, that that's in the, in the summer after a football workout when we went over to... You drank on weekdays, yes or no, sir? Uh, in the summer, when we went over to Timmy's house on July 1st, that would indicate yes. Yes, in other words, that, that July 1st reference to skis, went over for skis, that's brewskis, correct? And after Tobin, and sir, sir, I just need a yes or no. That brewskis, right? Well, I need to explain in context. Uh, you just said, sir, that you drank on weekdays. That's all I was looking for. Well, no. If I may, if I may uh, ask, if I may ask the next question, sir. We're, you said uh, clearly on the record. I just want you to restate it that you never in your life, after drinking heavily to the point of throwing up, and again, you said you had a weak stomach. You said you never had gaps in memories, never had any losses whatsoever, never had foggy recollection about what happened. Is that correct, sir? Yes or no? That's that's what I said. Okay. Um, sir, you also said uh, that this past two week, uh, this past uh, two weeks, has been a two-week effort, calculated and orchestrated as a political hit. 
Are you saying that Dr. Ford's efforts to come forward to prepare for the very difficult testimony she gave today, to travel to Washington, D.C. and tell us about her experience, have all been an, part of an orchestrated political hit? And, and are you basically calling her some kind of political operative? I've, I've said uh, my family has no ill will toward Dr. Ford. She wanted confidentiality. Her confidentiality was blown by the actions of this committee, and it's caused, it's turned this so into sir, a So, sir, let's just be clear. In other words, you're, you're, you have problems with the, the senators that are up here and how we conducted it, but you're not saying in any way that she is a political pawn, political operative. You, you have sympathy for her. She is talking about a sexual assault. Is that correct? I said uh, all allegations should be taken seriously. You should listen to both sides. Do, My do family wish, has no do, ill will you, toward her. Thank you, sir. Do you I, wish that she never came forward? Senator, I did not do this. The I, witness. That, that's not my question, sir. Could you try to answer my question, sir? Do you wish she never came forward? Uh, the witnesses who were there say it didn't happen. Okay, sir. Do you wish she just remained silent then? I wish uh, the witnesses who were there say it didn't happen. All allegations should be taken seriously. So, so even if it's in the final days days before a vote, if someone has a credible allegation of experience that they held for a long time, that person should be allowed to come forward. And in fact, as she said, it was her civic duty. You're not questioning her sense of civic duty, are you? She did You're come forward and then the, then the was, was... I know you have a lot of political animus. You stated it very clearly towards my colleagues and I on this panel. What, I, what I'm trying to get to the bottom of is you, you do not see her specifically as part of an orchestrated event. I, She's not a political party. I don't know her. But I've also said that we bear no ill will toward her. She wanted confidentiality. This could have been handled. And, and, and I understand. But she came forward. She took a great extent. Yeah. Your family has gone through hell. Her family has gone through hell. Right. She sat here. She told her truth. And, and you made the allegation that she was coordinating it. I do not think she was coordinating. I did therapists. not say that. That's a. That she, you said that's this was, a, I'm sorry. So you said that others were making a coordinated. A attack. Coordinated by. Jimmy, you were talking about us, room. not her. So, so she was not. Room she was not doing this for political yeah. efforts in 2012 when she talked to her therapist about this attack. She was not coordinating about this painful when she made painful experience when she made revelations to her husband. She did not coordinate in 2013, 16, 2017, before you even nominated when she revealed that it was you with three different people that had sexually assaulted her. That wasn't coordination. And Liz All the witnesses who were there say it didn't happen. Ms. Kaiser is her longtime friend, said she never saw me at a party sir, with sir, or without Dr. I, and Ms. Kaiser has said clearly, and I'll quote what she said. She said she does not remember that I in question. That, that, that supports what you said. But she also says that she believes Dr. Ford. And, and so my, my colleague, Lindsey Graham, who I, I respect and have admiration to and has been a partner of mine, he said voting no would be legitimizing the most despicable thing in American politics. Do you think that people who believe Dr. Ford are, are legitimizing despicable things? Those of us who think she's a credible witness, the allegations against her are credible, do you think that somehow we are engaging in something that's despicable? Senator, I, I say listen to both sides before you make a bottom line conclusion. And... Look at the... That is look, fair. Look at, I have look 10 seconds left, sir. You can, you can answer after I finish. You have 10 seconds left. That is fair. Listen to both sides. This is not about somebody, one side being despicable, the other side not. Listen to both sides. She was a credible... I'm, I'm going to finish my question. You can answer. The, the, she, she gave credible, meaningful testimony, a woman who had the courage to come forward and tell her truth, uh, sir. And, and that's what I'm just asking you to say. She is not... A, a political pawn. She is not orchestrating. She is not part of the Clinton's efforts to get some kind of revenge. She is a woman who came here with corroborating evidence to tell her truth. Is that a Thank question? You. No, sir. It was a final statement. Senator Krum. Just on one thing, Mr. Uh, Chairman, the, yes. the, the evidence is uh, not corroborated at the hey. time. The witnesses who were there say it didn't happen. No, that's not what okay. said. Senator Crew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Kavanaugh, you and your family have been treated incredibly poorly by Senate Democrats and by the media. And let me say also, I think Dr. Ford and her family had been treated incredibly poorly by Senate Democrats and the media. You have both seen your good names dragged through the mud. And this has been, sadly, one of the most shameful chapters in the history of the United States Senate. Let me say to you and your family, thank you for a lifetime of public service. I will say, watching your mother's pained face has been heart-wrenching as she's seen her son's character dragged through the mud 
after not only your lifetime of public service, but her lifetime of public service as well. And I know as a father, there's been nothing more painful to you than talking to your daughters and explaining these attacks is it worked out? that the media is airing. <coughs> I also believe, though, that the American people are a fair-minded people, that the American people can set aside the partisan warfare of Washington and look to substance and facts. And that is the charge of this committee. Now, there have been three different sets of allegations that have dominated the media. I think it's important to note that two of those sets of allegations had so little corroboration that even the New York Times, which is no conservative outlet, refused to report on them because they could find no basis for them. And it was striking in this entire hearing that not a single Democrat in this committee asked about two sets of those allegations. Ms. Ramirez's allegations and the allegations of the client of Mr. Avenetti. Not a single Democrat. I don't know if they were just too embarrassed. Mr. Avenetti's allegations were so scandalous that the ranking member omitted his client's most scandalous accusations of you as a criminal mastermind, essentially. Yeah. Omitted those scandalous accusations from her statement. This hearing has focused, rightly so, on the allegations Dr. Ford presented. And let me say, I think the committee did the right thing in giving Dr. Ford a full and fair opportunity to tell her story. That's what we needed to do when these allegations became public. And the committee treated her with respect, as we should. I do not believe Senate Democrats have treated you with respect. What do we know? We know that her testimony and your testimony are in conflict. A fair-minded assessor of facts would then look to what else do we know when you have conflicting testimony. Well, we know that Dr. Ford identified three fact witnesses who she said observed what occurred. All three of those fact witnesses have stated on the record under penalty of perjury that they do not recall what she is alleging happening. They have not only not not corroborated her charges, they have explicitly refuted her charges. That's significant to a fair-minded fact finder. In addition, you've walked through before this committee your calendars from the time. Now, I will say you were a much more organized teenager than I was, and than many of us were, but it was a compelling recitation of night by night by night where you were in the summer of 1982. That is yet another contemporaneous piece of fact to assess what happened. And we also know that the Democrats on this committee engaged in a profoundly unfair process. The ranking member had these allegations on July 30th. And for 60 days, that was 60 days ago, the ranking member did not refer it to the FBI for an investigation. The ranking member did not refer it to the full committee for an investigation. The ranking member, this committee could have investigated those claims in a confidential way that respected Dr. Ford's privacy. And some of the most significant testimony we heard this morning is Dr. Ford told this committee that the only people to whom she gave her letter were her attorneys, the ranking member, and her member of Congress. And she stated that she and her attorneys did not release the letter, which means the only people that could have released that, that letter were either the ranking member and her staff or the Democratic member of Congress, because Dr. Ford told this committee those are the only people who had it. That is not a fair process. And we should look to the facts, not anonymous innuendo and slander. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a point of personal privilege to respond. Proceed. Mr. Chairman, um, let me be clear. I did not hide Dr. Ford's allegations. I did not leak her story. She asked me to hold it confidential, and I kept it confidential as she asked. She apparently was stalked by the press, felt that uh, what happened, she was forced to come forward, and her greatest fear were realized, was realized. 
She's been harassed, she's had death threats, and she's had to flee her home. In, a, in addition, the investigation that the Republican majority is heralding is really nothing that I know about other than a partisan practice. Normally, all the witnesses would be interviewed. However, that's not happened. While the majority has reached out to several people, they did not notify me or my staff that they were doing this. And so to argue that we would not participate but not tell us what they were up to is somewhat disingenuous. I was given some information by a woman who was very much afraid who asked that it be held confidential, and I held it confidential until she decided that she would come forward. Mr. Chairman, would, would the ranking member um, answer a question, please? If I can. I, I have great respect for Senator Feinstein. We've worked together on many topics, and I believe what you just said. Can you tell us that your staff did not leak it? Oh, I don't believe my staff would leak it. I have not asked that question directly, but do you, I do, do not believe you know they that? would. I mean, how in the world could that get in the hands of the of the press? The answer is the, no. The staff have you have you asked your, have you asked your staff or other I staff just members did. of the Judiciary Committee? They, 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 pardon me. me well, a, a, Jennifer well, reminds me I've asked her before about it, well, somebody, and that's true. Well, somebody leaked it if it wasn't you. Well, it was, I'm telling you, it was not, I did not. I mean, I was asked to keep it confidential. And, and I'm criticized for that, too. M Mr. Chairman, it, c could I ask the chairman a question? Which is, does the committee have a process if there is an allegation against any nominee oh. to assess that allegation in a confidential forum rather than in the public, since Dr. Ford requested that it be kept confidential. Is there a process for the committee yeah. for considering confidential yes, allegations? Uh, and the answer is yes, and I sent Senator Tillis pointed out the document that I put out to show of all the things that we've done along the lines of your question. And Mr. Chairman, what would you have done if on July 30th the ranking member had, had raised this allegation with you? As the chairman of this committee, how would you have We would have done them? like we have done with every uh, background or let's say FBI report that comes from the White House with the nominee, and then uh, subsequent to that, because maybe the FBI got done with it three months ago, we go through the FBI or information comes to us, then we have our investigators in a bipartisan way, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, follow up on those, whatever those questions are or those problems that have to be worked out. So bipartisan investigators could have investigated this two months ago and it could have been heard in a confidential setting without Dr. Ford's name or Judge Kavanaugh's name being dragged through the body. Is that correct? And except for one or two conversations that we had with the judge through our investigators, Democrats didn't participate except in those two, but in those two or one or two, they didn't ask any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No. Um, I want to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, go may, ahead. I, may, I, may I respond? It's my understanding that her story was leaked before the letter became public. And she testified that she had spoken to her friends about it, and it's most likely that that's how the story leaked, and that she had been asked by press. But it did not leak from us, I assure you of that. Oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I... I'm a little confused. I thought only um, the member of the House and Senator Feinstein and her lawyers had the letter. So her friends she might have talked to about it couldn't leak the letter if they just had a verbal conversation unless she gave them a copy of the letter. Senator, I don't think the letter was ever leaked. Well, how, how did the uh, press know to contact her about her complaint. She apparently, she testified here this morning that she had talked to friends about it. They had the letter. And that press had talked to her. The letter was leaked. Senator, our judge, uh, since uh, there was reference to the problems, the legitimate problems and the, uh, and the change of lifestyle that Dr. Ford had, if you want some time to say the impact on your family. I'd be glad to hear you. If you don't want to talk about it, that's okay. I've, I've talked about that. Mr. Okay. Then uh, 
Senator Harris. Thank you. Judge Kavanaugh, have you taken a professionally administered polygraph test as it relates to this issue? Uh, no, the I'll do whatever the committee wants. Of course, those are not admissible in federal court, but I'll do whatever the committee wants. They're not admissible in federal court because they're Thank not you. reliable, as, Thank you, you. as you know. So you've not taken one. Right. Um, all three of the women who have made sworn allegations against you have called for an independent FBI investigation into the claims. You've been asked during the course of this hearing by four different members by my count at least eight times today. Um, and also earlier this week on national television, whether you would call for the White House to authorize an FBI investigation. Each time you have declined to do so. Now, you know, I know you do, that the FBI uh, is, is an agency of men and women who are sworn and trained law enforcement who in the course of conducting uh, background investigations on nominees for the Supreme Court of the United States and others um, are charged with conducting those background investigations because they are sworn law enforcement and they have the expertise and the ability and the history of doing that. So I'm going to ask you one last time. Are you willing to ask the White House to authorize the FBI to investigate the claims that have been made against you? Well, I'll do whatever the committee wants, of so, course. And I've heard you say that, but I've not, I've, not heard you ask, I've not heard you answer a very specific question that's been asked, which is, are you willing to ask the White House to conduct an investigation by the FBI to get to whatever you believe is the bottom of the allegations that have been levied against you? The FBI would gather witness statements. You have Sir, the witness it's, it's, statements. It's, it, they don't not, make... I don't want to debate with you how they do their business. I'm just asking, are you willing to ask the White House to conduct such an investigation? Because as you are aware, the FBI did conduct a background investigation into you yes, before I... we were aware of these most recent allegations. So are you willing to ask the White House to do that and say yes or no, and then we can move on? I've had six background investigations over 26 years. Sir, as it relates to the recent allegations, are you willing to have them do it? The, the, the witness testimony is before you. No witness who was there supports that I was there. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no and we can move on. You have said um, in your opening statement you characterized these allegations as a, as a conspiracy directed against you. Um, I'll point out to you that Judge Justice now, Neil Gorsuch, was nominated by this president. Um, he was considered by this body just last year. I did a rough kind of analysis of similarities. You both attended Georgetown Prep. You both attended very prestigious law schools. You both clerked for Justice Kennedy. You were both circuit judges. You were both nominated to the Supreme Court. You were both questioned about your record. The only difference is that you have been accused of sexual assault. How do you reconcile your statement about a conspiracy against you with the treatment of someone who was before this body not very long ago. I, I explained that in my opening statement, Senator. Um, look at the the evidence here, the, the calendars, look at the witness statements, look at Ms. Kaiser's statement. Okay. Um, and then, do you agree that it is possible for men to both be friends with some women? and treat other women badly? <clears throat> of course, but the point I've been emphasizing, and that is if you go back to age 14 for me, you will find people, and not just people, lots of people who I've been friends with, some of whom are in this room today, starting at age 14, women, and who talked about my friendships with them through my whole life, and it's a consistent pattern all the way through. 65 women, who knew me more than 35 years ago signed a letter to s support me after the allegation was made because they know me and they were with me and we grew up together. We talked on the phone together and we went to events together. That is who I am. What they've said, what the people who worked with me in the Bush White House, uh, the, the women there, look at what Sarah Day said in centralmaine.com, look at the, um, what the law clerks 
I have sent more women law clerks to the Supreme Court than any other federal judge in the country. I only have a few seconds left, and I'll just ask you a direct question. Did you um, watch Dr. Ford's testimony? Uh, I did not. I plan to. I plan to. You. I plan to, but I did not. So I was preparing mine. Uh, our last five minutes will be uh, Senator Flake, one minute, mm -hmm. and Senator Kennedy, four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when Dr. Ford came forward with her um, account, I immediately said that she should be heard and uh, asked the chairman to delay the vote that we had uh, scheduled. And the chairman did, and I appreciate that. And she came at great uh, difficulty for her and offered compelling testimony. Uh, you have come and done the same. I am sorry for what's happened to you and your family, as I'm sorry for what has happened to hers. And this is not a good process. But it's all we've got. And I would just urge my colleagues to recognize that in the end, we are 21 very imperfect senators trying to do our best to provide advice and consent. And in the end, there is likely to be as much doubt as certainty going out of this room today. And that as we make decisions going forward, I, I hope that people will recognize that. And in the rhetoric that we use, and the language that we use going forward, that we'll recognize that, that there is doubt. We'll never move beyond that. And uh, and just have a little humility on that front. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Flake. Now, Senator Kennedy. <coughs> Senator Kennedy. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, Judge, for what you and your family have been through. And I'm sorry for what Dr. Ford and her family have been through. It could have been avoided. Do you believe in God? I do. I'm going to give you a last opportunity. We're right here, right in front of God and country. I want you to look me in the eye. Are Dr. Ford's allegations true? They're not accurate as to me. I have not questioned that she might have been sexually assaulted at some point in her life by someone, someplace. But as to me, I've never done this. Never done this to her or to anyone else. And I've talked to you about uh, what I was doing that summer of 1982, but I'm telling you, I've never done this to anyone, including her. Are Ms. Ramirez's allegations about you true? Uh, those are not. Um, she, um, no, no, none of the witnesses in the room support that. Uh, the, if that, that had happened, that would have been the talk of campus uh, in our freshman dorm. The New York Times reported that as recently as last week, uh, she was calling other classmates seeking to well, I'm not going to characterize it, but calling classmates last week and just seemed very, um, I'll just stop there. But it's not true. It's not true. Are Ms. Swetnick's allegations made by Mr. Avenatti about you true? Those are not true. Never met her. Don't know who she is. There's a letter released within two hours of that breaking yesterday from, I think, 60 people who knew me in high school, men and women, who said it was, uh, their words, nonsense, totally, you know, the whole thing, that totally ridiculous. None of these allegations are true? Correct. No doubt in your mind? Zero. I'm 100% certain. Not even a scintilla? Not a scintilla. 100% certain, Senator. You swear to God? I swear to God. Oh, I have Judge. Judge Kavanaugh, thank you very much. Hearing adjourned.